What's up, STS Nation, and welcome to another episode of Surviving the Survivor, and this is one of the strangest ones yet. In just about three hours' time, it appears that the Alec Murdoch jurors have reached a verdict, blowing out of the water the prediction that Tim Jansen had the other day when he said it would be, I believe, 16 hours of deliberations with a guilty verdict. Uh, Tim is kind enough to join us right now. We've got a few other people on the hook here. Everything has kind of gone out the window, all of our plans, because of this impending verdict that's about to be read. We are monitoring multiple news outlets. The great Sarah Ford has joined us as well. Sarah, thanks for doing this, especially uh, as we know, we are uh, about to be uh, read a verdict. Tim, of course, is a criminal defense attorney out of the great state of Florida. It's had a lot of high profile cases, including Jameis Winston, former Florida State uh, University football player. And of course, Sarah Ford is a former prosecutor and she is glued to her phone. I can tell waiting to see what's going on with this verdict. And we have the great Jack Swirling. I just saw Jack. You got to unmute yourself there and uh, I will do that for you. Uh, You are unmuted, Jack. Oh, now you are remuted. Now I will unmute you. Now you are remuted. Hang on a sec, Jack. It's a good game, guys. And there he is. So, uh, look, Hi, got Sarah. one of the most prominent criminal defense attorneys in South Carolina, one of the most prominent criminal defense attorneys out of the great state of Florida, and just one of the greatest lawyers and people all around, Sarah Ford. Sarah Ford, to you first, as we are awaiting this verdict. Tim Jansen, who's on this panel with you, said it would be 16 hours of deliberations with a guilty verdict. Right now, by my calculations, it is under three hours with a verdict about to be read. How surprised are you by this? I'm not ever surprised by a jury because I expect the unexpected. You know, I've tried cases where I thought a verdict would come back quickly and it took hours. I've also been, you know, trying cases and, you know, it takes forever on a case that you're like, this should take at less than an hour. So uh, the one thing about juries is that you have to expect the unexpected. Um, You know, I, I personally thought it was going to be until tomorrow, but, uh, you know, when the jury knows, the jury knows. So we're we're ready for it. And uh, Jack, to you, what does it tell you with your vast, vast experience when a jury comes back in under three hours with a verdict that's about to be read on uh, media outlets around the world? But what's it tell you under three hours? Well, there are a lot of people calling me and there there are people predicting it's a short verdict or short period of time is favorable for the defense. And then I have other people calling me and say, no, that's good for the prosecution. So uh, I agree with what was said. You just never know. I mean, I've been in that situation before and been surprised. And I hope you'll all just kind of roll with the punches tonight because it is going to be a wild ride till we get this verdict. And uh, uh, Jack and Sarah, they're saying that uh, South Carolina time is kind of like Miami time. It moves slower than the rest of the world. So we'll see how long this takes. But Tim, Uh, Not a lot of people either with as much experience as you have, especially in high profile cases. Um, What does it tell you uh, that the jury reached a verdict here in under three hours? You told me something before we went on. It's definitely not a not guilty, you think? I I would not think it's a not guilty this short. I think there's going to be at least a couple that are going to hold out and believe he did it, even if they don't have the motive and it's only circumstantial. I think that his testimony... I think the closing by uh, Griff was kind of lackluster. I thought he played his cards when he said in Scotland, you either have a not guilty or or not proven. And he was trying to combine those by saying not proven. And I think he didn't really give a dynamic closing that he believed in his client. Um, So I think the jury, I think, found the rebuttal by the prosecution to be much stronger they got the last argument, and I think um, they didn't believe uh, Alec. It appears that people have filed back into the courtroom. And, uh, okay, I'm going to put on the audio here and let the mic pick it up, and then we'll pick up the commentary on the back end. Female, female four-person. So let's just all watch this together now, guys. A female four-person. Okay. 
Alec Murdoch rising for the occasion. General Sessions in the term of 2022, July, the state versus Richard Alexander Murdoch defendant, indictment for murder, SC code 16-3-0010, CDR code 0116, guilty verdict, signed by the four lady, Three two twenty three. Docket number two thousand twenty two GS dash fifteen zero zero five nine three. The state of South Carolina, County of Colleton, in the Court of General Sessions, the July term of two thousand twenty two. The state versus Richard Alexander Murdoch, defendant, indictment for murder, SC Code sixteen dash three dash zero zero one zero. CDR code 0116, verdict guilty, signed by the four lady, date 3-2 of 23. Docket number 2022-GS15-00595, the state of South Carolina, County of Colleton, Court of General Sessions, July term 2022, the state versus Richard Alexander Murdoch, defendant, Indictment for possession of a weapon during the commission of a violent crime. SC Code-16-23-0490. CDR Code-0549. Verdict guilty. Signed by the foreperson of the jury. Date 3-2-23. Docket number 2022-GS-15-00594. The state of South Carolina, County of Colleton, Court of General Sessions, July term 2022. The state versus Richard Alexander Murdoch, defendant. Indictment for possession of a weapon during the commission of a violent crime. SC code 16-23-0490. CDR code 0549. Verdict guilty. Signed by the foreperson of the jury. Three, two, twenty-three. Thank you, uh, Madam Four Lady and members of the jury. If that is a verdict of each and every juror, please let it be known by raising your right hands. All right, thank you. Any individual polling requested? Uh, Madam Clerk, you will need to individually poll the ju jury according to their jury. Juror numbers. Number 193. Was this your verdict? Yes. Sir. Is it still your verdict? Yes. Juror 22, I'm sorry, juror 254. Yes. Is this your verdict? Yes. Is it still your verdict? Yes. Juror 326. Was this your verdict? Yes. Is it still your verdict? Yes. Juror 6, juror 530. Was this your verdict? Yes. Is this your verdict? Yes. Juror 544. Yes. Was this your verdict? Yes. Is it still your verdict? Yes. Juror 572. 
Was this your verdict? Yes. Is it still your verdict? Yes. Juror 578. Was this your verdict? Yes. Is it still your verdict? Yes. Juror 589. Was this your verdict? Is it still your verdict? Juror 630. Was this your verdict? Yes. Is it still your verdict? Yes. Juror 729. Was this your verdict? Yes. Is it still your verdict? Yes. Juror 826. Was this your verdict? Yes. Is it still your verdict? Yes. Juror 864. Was this your verdict? Yes. Is it still your verdict? Yes. You're on the jury. Pass it for Thank you. The jury, the jury has been called and the verdict is a unanimous verdict. If you will bring the alternate juror out and have her uh, have a seat in the audience, please. stand there or you can sit back there whatever you prefer okay are there any post-trial motions we would just renew our previously um uh, argue motions for directed murder and at this on, on the grounds on those grounds we would push for this trial to set aside the murder. um by the state response. Your Honor, based on our previous arguments, we would submit that the uh, case properly went to the jury and the verdict is proper. We can have to rely on those arguments. Uh, we've been here now 28 days, um, first few days of jury selection and the remainder receiving testimony, uh, a, an overwhelming amount of testimony and evidence that was presented to the jury for the jury's consideration as i indicated to the jury during the jury charge or the charge on the law that this was a matter solely for jury the jury to determine uh, the court found at the end of the state's case that there's sufficient evidence to find the guilty if the evidence uh, was believed by the jury Likewise, at the end of the, the uh, defense's case, when the motion was renewed, the court um, found that the evidence was sufficient for the jury to find the defendant guilty. The jury has now considered the evidence um, for a significant period of time, and um, the evidence of guilt is overwhelming. And uh, I deny the motion. The Mr. Murdoch, you now having been found guilty of two counts of murder involving your wife and your son, two counts of possession of a weapon during the commission of a violent crime. Uh, the burden now comes upon the court to impose a sentence. Uh, given the lateness of the hour and the victims' rights that must be um, taken into consideration and complied with under the Victims' Bill of Rights and consider what I anticipate to be a number of people who might have something to say regarding sentencing. Uh, we will defer sentencing to a later date. Of course, the um, minimum sentence for murder is 30 years. The maximum sentence is life imprisonment as to each count. And the on the weapons charge, the sentence is up to five years or five years. Which has to be concurrent if a life sentence is imposed. When would you all like?
like to uh, reconvene for sentencing, I would like to give everyone an adequate opportunity to prepare, prepare for it. So we'll be ready at 9.30 in the morning, Your Honor. We can do it at 9.30 tomorrow morning also. All right. The um, defendant is remanded to the custody of the um, Collison County Sheriff's Department. And he may be taken away. Members of the jury, I want to thank you on behalf of the citizens of the state of South Carolina and your fellow citizens of Collinson County. Uh, you did not volunteer for this service. You were uh, called upon by the being summoned to appear, and Providence have brought you to this moment in time and these weeks and time. I know that all of you have been here at a great sacrifice, uh, particularly the um, juror whose job was on the line uh, until a miracle happened, I guess, that allowed him to be able to leave rather than to stay at rather than leave after uh, two or three weeks. Um, but I want to thank each one of you all individually and collectively. Uh, it's not often that you're called upon to uh, sit in judgment of the actions of your fellow man that you all responded and um, and gave due consideration to the evidence. Um, I will make no comment now as to the um, extent or the overwhelming nature of the evidence, uh, but certainly the verdict that you've reached is supported by the evidence, uh, circumstantial evidence, direct evidence, all of the evidence pointing to only one conclusion. That's the conclusion that you all reach. And so I applaud you all for, um, as a group uh, and as a unit and individually, uh, evaluating the evidence and coming to the proper uh, conclusion as you see, as you saw the law, as you saw the facts. Um, now that you've served for the next year, you're not eligible to serve again. Now, of course, many people never get called upon, but you're not eligible for the next year. And for two additional years, uh, you can be exempted from service because no person is required to serve on jury duty in this court more often than once every three uh, years. Uh, tomorrow morning at 9.30, um, we will reconvene for sentencing. Uh, you all have no role in that because that's solely up to the judge to me. Uh, you're welcome to come back if you want to and be a part of the audience, uh, if you like. I also want to thank the alternate juror who was locked away in a room by herself for these hours, um, uh, who um, who's hung in there during that period of time. I want to thank you as well. Um, Madam Clerk, what do you have to tell your jurors? Thank you for your service. And I want to judge thank you for that as well. And I think we can release them tonight and bring them back in the morning. No, they're off duty. They're off jury duty. They, can, duty. they can come they back can come if back they like. And you don't have to if you don't want to. 
Um, typically, I've, I've seen jurors uh, wanting to see the end result of a case once they've invested a lot into it. It's really an amazing thing uh, with juries. Uh, quite often, at the start of the case, jurors are uh, really like, whoa, why am I here? I wish I wasn't selected. But as time passes and the jurors, jurors become invested and really committed to the case and committed to seeing it through um, and are very disappointed when they are not able to see it to a conclusion. And then along the way um, of serving, you end up finding out quite a bit about our judicial system uh, and learning quite a bit, uh, well, about human nature for sure, uh, but also uh, about the presentation of evidence and hearing from expert witnesses and really learning a lot of things that uh, you'll be able to take with you when you leave during duty. And to uh, Madam Four Lady, uh, I don't know if you're hesitant initially or not, but you have stepped up to the plate and done a great job of uh, leading the jury as well and, and thank all of you so the jury is dismissed if now one thing before you go of course um we have <clears throat> invested a lot in maintaining the privacy of of the jury of each one of you and um you're free at this point to discuss the case with anyone uh, given the high profile nature of the case i'm certain that the uh, many people in the media would like will probably want to uh, communicate with you but they have no means of contacting you because under order that i issued the identity of the jurors must be kept private and if um, you decide that you want to speak with anyone local state nationally or internationally uh, that's your prerogative however should anyone harass you please let me know and I will address those issues uh, if anyone through the somehow or another discover your identity and, and harass you uh, and rest assured I will intercede on your behalf. That having been said, uh, you are free to communicate with whomever you might want to concerning the case from now on. So with that, thank you and you all are free to go. So it was uh, six weeks almost to the day, one day shy of a full six-week trial uh, as the courthouse is now standing for Judge Clifton Newman, who did uh, yeoman's work throughout this trial. Uh, less than three hours of deliberations, uh, the verdict was read before a packed courtroom, guilty Alec Murdoch, guilty on both murder charges. He appeared to have almost next to no emotion, uh, quite a juxtaposition from what we saw uh, during that cross-examination where we saw that flood of tears, the bodily secretions this time around, hardly a uh, e even a, a movement from him as he stood while that verdict was being read. Judge Newman letting him know that the sentencing will be tomorrow at 9.30 a.m. He faces 30 years to life in prison, obviously with these additional charges on all the theft. Uh, it is likely he will never see the light of day again. Uh, he will be behind bars. And uh, from the comments, which we're going to start to go through um, diligently, it appears that people, uh, many, if not most are uh, relieved that justice has been served after this six week trial. Alec Murdoch remanded back for the evening to the Carlton County Jail in a dramatic moment. He was handcuffed before the packed courtroom. Judge Newman then thanked the citizens on the jury, saying that all of you have been here at great 
sacrifice. Uh, Jack Swirling, you have seen this play out, scenes like this before, but not quite maybe as big as this one. Uh, what did you make of what we just witnessed? Well, I, I was surprised, but not shocked. Uh, I could say that. Uh, I really thought that the jury would be deliberating longer than three hours. Uh, there were over 500, close to 600 exhibits, 28 days or, or so of testimony. Uh, there were certain areas there that were strong points for the state, and there were all areas that were strong points for the defense. So I, my surprise is uh, the length of the, the deliberations. That's what I would have to say. Sarah Ford, you're also uh, in the Palmetto State, uh, closely tied to many of the people involved in this case. Your uh, immediate reaction after hearing the two guilty charges uh, on both of these murder charges as it relates to both Maggie and Paul? I'm not surprised. I think that the, the Attorney General's office um, did an excellent job. This is a difficult case. This is, you know, months and months of work on their on their parts and weeks that this jury has listened so diligently to uh, to the evidence. And I think that absolutely the jury got it right. Um, you know, we've heard so much talked about, uh, you know, the difference between direct evidence and circumstantial evidence and 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 really had um, I, I, on your show. Even I've been the odd woman out because that's been my position since the very beginning. Um, but I think that the jury made the right call. Uh, I'm, I'm surprised that it was so quick. I thought we'd be here tomorrow talking about this, but um, I think they they made the right the right call. And listen, Absolutely. I just want to say something because, you know, there's a lot of gamesmanship, a lot of theatrics, as Tim has pointed out in the courtroom. Uh, and justice was served today. But at the end of the day, I'm actually feeling a bit sad and somber right now because two lives were taken. Alec Murdoch's life is gone, essentially, for all intents and purposes. And Buster Murdoch no longer has a family. So all around. Um, while justice was served and uh, an evil man is probably going to where he should be spending the rest of his life, it is a tragic story all around. But Tim, you've obviously seen scenes, have seen scenes like this play out as well. Uh, you had predicted a 16 hour uh, deliberation, uh, less than a quarter of that. Uh, guilty, guilty on both murder charges. Did it surprise you in any way? Oh, and let, hang on a sec, Tim. I have to unmute you. I apologize. Can you hear me? Yep. Pick that back oh, up. I'm, I'm surprised by the length of the deliberation, but I've had cases where circumstantial evidence is much stronger than eyewitness, uh, and I've been a part of that. And this case had so much circumstantial evidence. When Alec got, decided to take the stand, the jurors found him not credible in any way. He was unable to really... Uh, explain about the the lie about being at the kennel. And I thought during Griff's closing, he got to a crescendo and said, so why did he lie? Why did he lie? The lie about the kennel. And he completely stumbled. He didn't have a real answer. And he said, well, he lied. And everybody was on their seat. And he said, well, because liars lie. I think he just lost the case right there and then because there was no explanation. And what, Tim, what do you attribute to that to? Is that poor preparation? Was it a lapse at that moment? Or he just couldn't explain it away? Well, when you're given a closing, you have to believe in your closing. You have to believe in your client. I never saw that from Griff. He didn't get indignant. He wasn't yelling or proving that he really believed in his client. And as far as the facts and a lawyer, listen, I know some really bad lawyers that have good facts and they make them look good. And I know some really good lawyers that have some really bad facts and it makes them look bad. So a lot of times it's beyond the lawyer's control, but it was a very haphazard closing. I don't think he was up for it. And I think he had some bad facts. Sarah to you. And we're going to get to Steve Peterson is joining us as well. And he is the, uh, private investigator for Stephen Smith's family, which is a whole other part of this story. We'll get to him in a moment. What did you think? Um, you know, I've heard, I'm obviously not from South Carolina, nor am I an attorney, but I've heard all along 
about, you know, Jim Griffin's prowess. He seemed to really come up short today, um, rambling quite a bit, not really getting the points in that he needed to make. Do you feel that way? You know, I think um, Alex, Alec Murdoch really locked himself in when he testified. I mean, you know, I, I, I say this all the time, you know, I went to law school, not magician school. You know, we can only do so much as a lawyer. Um, and when your client testifies that the way that Alec Murdoch did, um, you know, you do the best you can with what you've got. Um, and I think that that Jim Griffin, um, you know, did a good job. Certainly, uh, you know, we could always say, you know, it could be better here, it could be better there. But I think he did the best he could with what he had. Um, and, uh, you know, it wasn't enough. His his, uh, you know, best uh, lawyering skills weren't enough to overcome um, you know, the testimony of Alec Murdoch and, and the evidence against him. And I want to get as much of STS Nation involved as we can tonight. Kelly Work writing, I did not find guilty beyond a reasonable doubt myself. Uh, RIP Maggie and Paul, not even reading these beforehand. Jen Till, amazing. This actually worked out as it should. RIP Maggie and Paul. Sweet justice. He's guilty as F. This is justice. Yes, it's this one here, it's a new day in the South from Pop Bear in Moscow, Idaho, believe me. Um, onto zero emotion of Alex. He doesn't feel he can fake emotion when he wants. Susan, you're an expert in human behavior. Um, what did you think just now watching Alex's reaction or lack thereof when the verdict was being read, but just a day or so ago, he was sobbing uncontrollably on that stand when his life was in question. This is Rick at News Nation in New York. Can you hear me? I am so sorry, guys. I've got News All right, Nation Susan. calling me. I got to uh, run. All right. No it's going to be a wacky night, everyone. So bear with us. Uh, Amy Lawrence Lovely, can you hear me? Hey, guys. Hey, yeah, hello. Hi, Amy. Um, so uh, do me a favor. Just tell us your reaction to this, um, especially... I was just asking uh, Susan Clementine, who's an expert in human behavior and how to jump off. Um, two days ago, I believe it was, I'm losing track of time. Um, actually, it was last week. I'm totally lo losing track of time. We saw Alec Murdoch sobbing you know, uncontrollably today. These guilty verdicts were read, almost no emotion, uh, literally none. What did you make of that? I think he, pre I think he prepared his heart for it, right? I mean, we, uh, that's what, I mean, we always try to prepare our clients for the worst and hope for the best. And I think that he was, I think he was hopeful, but I think he also, I mean, he, he sat through his own trial and, and he knew what he was dealing with and what he was up against. Um, I think he probably was a little cocky going into it, thinking that he had a little more, a little more pull in that county. I think we all thought he might, that um, his county would give him the benefit of the doubt, his own people, and they did, and they saw it for what it is. Steve Peterson, if he is ready to go, I'm trying to unmute you here, Steve. Steve's like, I called it. I called it. <laughs> Steve, um, it appears that this jury had their collective mind made up way before they even entered that deliberation room. Your thoughts on this very quickly reached verdict guilty on both murder charges? Well, I, I am surprised at how quickly the verdict came back. As you can tell by my surroundings, I wasn't prepared to be on the show tonight, and uh, I have a house full of people. We're moving some furniture around. When I got the call and when, when the verdict came in, we we switched the TVs on. Everybody's out there watching. So I went to the quietest place in my house, which is my closet, so <laughs> I can get on the air with you guys. Um, you know, I predicted we would go to tomorrow, and then the judge would give an Allen charge, and then Monday the jury would come back and they would convict. But they didn't need that. And I think all the the arguments today and yesterday, the closing arguments, I think I don't even know that they were necessary. I think the jury saw through the the BS. I think they saw Alec on the stand, you know, cry on demand, uh, uh, emotions on demand, and then suddenly snap right out of it. And you know, they, everybody keeps going back to this. Well, how could he kill his wife and son, the people he loved the most? And this is the guy that stared into the face of the, the children whose mother raised Alex's own children. And they stole millions of dollars from them. 
I mean, the man has no heart. And 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 I'm sorry. I'm glad we do have justice for for Maggie and Paul. I do. What I hope is we don't lose sight of Gloria Satterfield, what really happened to her, nor Stephen Smith. Mallory Beach, justice will come in time. And for those I have a question. I just have a question. Do you think the Netflix documentary coming out when it did played any part of this? No, I, I because and I hate to say this because I was on a Netflix documentary. The first, at least the first two episodes seem to me to be very similar to other documentaries we've already seen. I don't know that I learned anything new on the first two episodes, which was the the beach thing and then the, the murders. You know, we didn't really learn anything new about this case, I don't believe, until we got into Gloria and Stephen Smith. So... And there wasn't much Stephen Smith because we really haven't been able to tie him directly to the Murtaughs. Sled is the one who drew that nexus in their announcement and reopening the investigation. So I haven't been able to find the connection yet, although I have opinions, but opinions don't put people in prison. Pe opinions don't convict people. So it doesn't really matter how I think. What matters is what I can prove. And uh, John Barth Art uh, writes, LWAP, life without parole, followed by, thank you, jury, fo followed by no tears from Alec. Buster looks disturbed. Uh, he has every reason to be disturbed. I can't imagine what's going through his mind tonight. Uh, from Amy Co., thank you, jurors. Uh, to this comment here, I hope this is not the case. Daniel Malloy writes, he's going to try to commit suicide. He won't be able to handle the state pen. Uh, to amazing, guilty as F, um, to L, I mean, this is the investment the court of public opinion had. L La La writes, I can't see through my tears. Uh, Sarah Ford, it's fitting we have you on tonight because you work um, admittedly for less money than guys like Jack Swirling and Tim Jansen um, because you help domestic violence survivors, um, unfortunately, Neither Paul nor Maggie survived this domestic violence, uh, a horrific form of it. Um, what what happens now? Um, first off, for Alec, uh, just if you can walk people through kind of the the judicial, uh, you know, uh, inner workings. He's going to be remanded to the county court in Colton right now. He'll be sentenced tomorrow. How does it all play out? Where does he go after that? So after he is uh, sentenced tomorrow, he'll go back to Cotton County. They will transport him um, to Columbia for uh, R&E, which is basically where they will receive all new inmates um, and they are receiving an evaluation um, and all inmates are evaluated based on, um, you know, mentally, physically, all of that. Um, they will determine his placement, um, you know, the, his, his sentence, um, assuming, you know, uh, well, it's obviously 30 years day for day or uh, life without parole. Um, and he will probably be an Arnie in Columbia for a month or two before being um, sent to whatever prison he is determined to go to. Obviously, it will be a uh, violent, um, violent prison, uh, most serious level three in South Carolina. Um, and, and, you know, in that point, um, you know, he will have filed any appeals, um, post-conviction relief, perhaps by that point, um, you know, uh, basically saying, you know, all these rulings were wrong. My lawyers were defective, um, whatever he can, whatever he can say. Um, but it will uh, be a pretty swift process um, over the next couple of days, moving him. Um, I'm, I'm a little bit surprised that the judge did, um, did not go ahead with the sentencing, but I appreciate certainly as a victim's rights lawyer um, that he was protecting those victim's rights, making sure that, you know, um, family members of, of Maggie and Paul who, wish to be there. Um, they do have a right to speak on their behalf under our state constitution um, and address the court and give impact. Um, so I, I certainly appreciate that as a victim's rights lawyer. And, and just so you all know, we are expecting a news conference. Uh, I'm sure we're going to hear from A.G. Wilson, as well as Creighton Waters, uh, maybe John Metters also. I'm not sure if the defense will speak, but um, we'll do what we did during the verdict and I will let you listen to the audio. We'll all stand by. I'm monitoring that. Uh, to see uh, when it 
uh, will happen. Um, and I know Sarah's going to have to jump off, I believe, at 8 o'clock. So we're just going to roll with it tonight. That's what STS Nation does. Um, Jack, to you, uh, this is not really a story anymore, but it was prior to the verdict being read. And that's the fact that juror number 785 uh, was removed um, after having a conversation outside the courtroom. Um, she denied discussing the case. It was a whole thing where SLED actually had to investigate. Uh, two other people that were questioned about it waffled. So we've had literally, uh, you know, th this jury tampering. We've had a bomb threat at one point. We've had COVID. Um, pretty much anything you can imagine, um, Jack. And you've been doing this longer than anybody on the panel, uh, and then some. Um, and I'm just curious, how are you going to reflect on this? It might be a little too soon, but just kind of your immediate thoughts on the sort of the insanity of everything that we have just witnessed. Well, I think that's a good way to describe it, the insanity of it. I mean, here you have a guy who was a lawyer who came from a, a family that was well-respected in that area, a uh, hundred years of being prosecutors, very, they were privileged people. Uh, and he was a, a, a pally. I mean, I never saw Alex try a case, but I was aware of his reputation as well as some of the other lawyers in the firm. Uh, so it, it's something that I, I think people will reflect on for a long time because you have to expect the unexpected when you're trying cases. I mean, I've tried dozens and dozens of murder cases, and I'm always surprised uh, as far as things that may happen during the case. Not necessarily the verdict, but what will happen. Uh, we had a case uh, not, not too long ago, a few weeks ago, a few months ago, I'm sorry, where uh, the family of one of the defendants followed one of the jurors home uh, and asked the juror to, you know, please be lenient. Uh, I can tell you that that wasn't handled very uh, uh, sympathetically to uh, that uh, defendant. Uh, so, you know, you have to just expect the unexpected. Uh, you're talking about the, the highest human emotion you're ever going to find. And that's in a, in a murder case or uh, and sometimes it's just in domestic cases where people reach a pitch uh, and you really can't control uh, which way the, the emotions are going to go. Very eloquently stated. Um, and Sarah, I want to ask you, obviously, before you have to go. So we just talked about what will be the next steps for Alec Murdoch. But, you know, if you were counseling Buster Murdoch, because he's now the one really glaring a uh, remaining victim with, and pardon the pun, with open wounds to deal with. Um, how would you counsel him? Um, I know you're an attorney, but what, what would you tell him to do right now? Um, I mean, he's an adult by uh, definition, but uh, meaning he's over 21, but he's still a young guy, basically a kid in, in most of our eyes. So what would you say to him? How would you counsel him? You know, his entire life, is, as he's known it, has been completely turned upside down. Um, you know, he's he's lost all of his immediate family, um, and you know, I think that the the one thing I would I would counsel him on is um, you don't have to do anything that you are not comfortable doing. You don't have to say anything that you're not comfortable saying. You don't have to uh, pretend. You don't have to. Um, be here for anybody other than yourself. And if whatever is the right thing for you to do in this moment, then that's what you need to do. Um, and I think that, that um, you know, everyone who has so many expectations on him as a victim, um, you know, they have to deal with that. Um, he is, he's got to, to grieve this moment. He's obviously still grieving his, his mother and his brother. Um, but those expectations are meaningless. Um, he, he is what's most important in his own life right now. Um, and he's got to take the time for whatever he needs, whether that's standing behind his father tomorrow, whether that's speaking on his mother and brother's behalf, whatever he says tomorrow. Um, I think that we have to to accept that with with an open heart and an open mind, because you're absolutely right. His, his wounds are, are raw and will, will continue to be. Um, and we have to we have to think about, you know, he's a young man um, and his life will never, ever be the same. Um, and so we need to, to look at him through the eyes or with the eyes of a victim um, and be respectful of that. Beautifully said. Uh, Amy Lawrence Lovely shaking her head in agreement. I'm going to unmute you here, Amy. Uh, I 
think you're going to have to unmute yourself there, Amy. There you go. Um, this comment is um, poignant by Murray Muncy. The little detective solved his own murder. Um, before we get to the comment, we heard Judge Clifton Newman, who I think is phenomenal. And we can talk about him in a little bit about how well he handled this entire trial from start to finish, especially in light of the fact that he lost his own loved one, his own son. Uh, he was really amazing. Um, he did tell the jurors that they are free now to speak to the media. But if they don't want to speak to the media and the media harasses any one of them, uh, <laughs> you made it known that you will handle business as it needs to be handled. But invariably in cases like this, high profile, uh, the jurors will speak. Uh, we know that a woman was a jury four person. Uh, we don't know why they came to a conclusion so quickly, but you have to believe that one of the things was that video from just moments before the murders where we hear Alec Murdoch's voice and everyone, friends and people who knew him corroborated that it was in fact him. Um, do you find irony in this that uh, it was sort of the one thing he may have overlooked and the one thing that probably trapped him and got him caught and it came from his own son whose life he took? Right. I mean, it ended up being Paul's Paul's last video, right? His last thing that ended up doing it. Um, and it was and it was his undoing because no one can wrap their mind around lying about the last time you see your kid alive if there's no reason to not to lie about it, right? And I think that between the video and the GMC records, that's what sealed the deal in my head because in the very, you know, from the very beginning, I've been very open to whichever way it would go. You know what I mean? As, as the evidence unfolded and may, and I've said this before, maybe it was like my own, my own like internal thing that like people like me, a lawyer, we don't kill our kids, right? We don't kill our families. Um, but as, as everything unfolded, we saw that video that Paul took of at the dog kennels and him continuing to lie about it up until he takes the stand. It's, that being his undoing, you know, I, I've thought about Buster a lot because everybody wants to give Buster um, a hard time that he didn't show enough emotion. He's stone cold. How do you stand behind your dad? And when I think about it, like, what's the alternative that you believe that your dad could kill your mom and your brother? And that's a world that no one wants to live in. Right. So, I mean, how can you not stand behind your father in that moment and and, tr and believe that he's the one who could do that? to your family. And so I guess my mind, you know, I can't, Paul and Maggie have had their justice in this moment, but my mind and my heart and, and my mommy brain goes to, and my, my mama bear instincts go to protection mode for Buster because he's pretty much all alone now, right? His whole family is gone. That's gotta be, I mean, that's gotta be so hard and my heart just breaks for him. And I can hear the emotion and I feel the same way. It's uh, it's a sad evening. I think a lot of people think it's going to be joyous because justice is served. But again, an entire family. Uh, I, mean, is I, I mean, I think collectively as a country and as people who have watched this, weren't we all hoping that he didn't do it? Hmm. I mean, that was my prayer and hope that he didn't do it. But as we watched the evidence unfold, because we would not seen it until now, we realized the reality is, is that he did it. You know, and that's really hard to swallow. But I think it was always our hope that he didn't kill his family. It's always my hope that no one would, you know, would kill someone, especially their own child and their wife, who by all accounts, by everybody talking, loved and adored. Like it just didn't even seem like reality. We're hoping that he didn't do it. But the reality of it is, is that he did. And I want to say that uh, a, a real big thank you to all of you, STS Nation, but also to our best guests. And it's not just a tagline. We're the best guests who I will fight for because these guys uh, really do amazing work coming in here day in and day out. Uh, everything kind of shifted, obviously, when we were getting ready to get on to uh, the show tonight. Uh, even Amy Zimmercheck has appeared here, uh, and it almost brings a tear to my eye that uh, people are coming on to STS Nation here to uh, give their feelings about this verdict after helping us cover this case for so many weeks. I just want to say Thanks to all the best guests and thanks to uh, STS Nation. But, Amy, uh, we haven't gotten um, your reaction. And for those who don't know, 
Amy is cousin Curtis Eddie Smith's attorney, Free uh, as, Eddie. Well as, as, <laughs> as well as a phenomenal uh, criminal defense attorney who works 21 hours a day. Um, <laughs> Amy, your reaction. Uh, 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 this is my reaction. I tell you, I'm, I'm thankful for my client. I think that this was the best outcome for my client. It's hard for me. In fact, a, a, fr a very close friend of mine was joking me uh, with me earlier that if this case turned me pro prosecution. It did not turn me pro prosecution. <laughs> um, what I think I've maintained throughout this, this entire trial is, you know, the dedication to my client and, I just know and I've seen what my client's been through as a result of his interactions with Alec Murdoch. And so for me, it it's a way it's a way to to confirm my client's experience. And it's a way for people to see that there's so many sides to Alec that nobody knew about. And the, the, the side that my client knew about and got roped into, I think, is finally a little bit more understandable for people to see. Jack, I want to ask you a question. I, I'm a man of my word. I try to be. Um, I get a lot of mail these days, a lot of tweets. Uh, there's a question that came in from Don Carter. Um, you know, even three hours and 10 minutes ago, so much of what we were going to talk about is it was very relevant. A lot of that has shifted. But this is a question from earlier in the day, and I, I want to get your reaction, uh, Jack. Uh, it comes from a woman named Don Carter, and here's the question. How do you do this if you are Jim Griffin and this is your close friend? With all this evidence now out, does Jim really believe Alec Murdoch didn't do it? Or will he not reconcile all that in his mind until after the trial is over? Well, I think an experienced criminal defense lawyer would like to always believe in their client. And I'm not so sure that Jim is conceding that his client is guilty. In fact, I know he's not. Uh, but it is, it, it's a difficult thing to deal with. Uh, we all have to realize that we can lose cases and the jury could disagree with the defense we put up, uh, could disagree with the facts and they could find somebody guilty even though we fight for it. But I believe in the system. And I believe in the jury system. And the jury gets it right most of the time. Amy, when you saw uh, Jim Griffin in his uh, closings today, and I think the consensus was it was less than stellar, did you have any feeling at all that he sort of stopped, I don't know, believing that there could be any any semblance of innocence on Alex's part in that moment? Or, I don't know, it, it appeared like he was surrendering. Um, how did you read it? I, um, I'll tell you, it's so easy, and Jack knows this because he's, you know, done a lot of closings and, and probably commented on a lot as well. It's it's so easy to play armchair quarterback. I don't know what um, Jim was going through. You know, I'm, I, if I were Jim, I would have been really excited to have a whole nother night to prepare um, for my, um, you know, for my closing. And, and I think that I would have been a little bit more dynamic. I was surprised that he was reading a lot. Um, I know it's been a long trial and a long week. And I like Jim. He's a good attorney. He's made some some steps that I would question in this case. Um, but, you know, I don't I, I used to. And I think that people kind of on the outside used to think that closing arguments were the, you know, were the key. But but I, I think that this case in particular really shows that um, it's it, it all starts in the opening. And I think that's kind of how we ended up so six, 28 days into this because nobody really, ha really had a clear roadmap of where we were going. And I think that the state just did a better job in this sense of being able to kind of take all of these things in time together. Um, you know, I've known John Metters for years and um, seen him lose a lot of trials to my very good friend, Sean Kent. But, uh, but I, um, I was, incredibly impressed with his with his rebuttal argument i really if if there was a moment that maybe changed it for the jury it i would rest it not so much on jim's failure but on on john's real ability to kind of tie it all together he's the son of a preacher man yeah he is <laughs> yeah 
And, and Tim, to you, because you're a guy that understands showmanship inside the courtroom, um, the contrast to me today, and we were talking while this was going on, between uh, Griffin and John Metters was very stark. But what did you make of Metters' uh, rebuttal for the state? I thought it was really, really uh, eloquently said and performed um, – just being a news guy, just the fact he had no notes and he was just moving along uh, very fluidly. What did you think of it? Got to unmute you. Hang on one sec. Oh, there you go. He truly believed in his case. He knew the facts. He delivered those facts in a poignant way. He was respectful, but yet accusatory enough that he's a murderer. Um, he filled the holes that the defense was trying to make. And, and he showed emotion. He truly believed he's a murderer, and he, we proved it. And the jury be believed him. He had credibility. He was animated. He walked around. He kept the attention. And he showed how preposterous some of the stories were. He brought in some storytelling about his dad, and um, it made him a regular person, like the jurors. Jurors like that. They like the guy up there that talks like them and is one of them. They don't like some fancy lawyer that gets up there and tells them how to think. And I think that's what he did very well today. Joe, if I could just interject something. I One of the uh, great lines that Metters had, and I've known John since the late 80s, uh, and I've tried a lot of cases against him. He's very folksy and he's very animated. Uh, but he had one of the great lines in the closing, uh, and I, if I could give him credit for that. Uh, he talked about how uh, Paul got his father from the grave, uh, that he used the video as a weapon to make sure uh, that his father was not, a get, not going to get away with this. And that, that hit me hard when he made that comment. And I bet you it hit the jury hard, too. Yeah, I mean, I, th I thought he was very uh, poetic in the way uh, he delivered everything. Again, Maui Swift, a friend of the show, says... Um, the video did him in um, and I'm just going to look at a few more comments here. There are a lot of questions that are unanswered. Uh, this is an example from extreme. I'm sure that hair was planted by Alec Murdoch. She didn't get near anyone before being gunned down. Someone else said it was Buster's hair. There was hair, unknown hair in Maggie's hand. Amy, when are we going to get answers to some of these um, mysterious questions uh, that people still want the answer to? Which Amy? Uh, Amy Z. My apologies. She has the answers. <laughs> I'm looking. I'm looking at the beautiful Amy Lawrence. Lovely. Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, She's um, like, should we tell them? Should we tell them the answers? Well, <laughs> should, we, should we tell them it was the dog hair? No. Um, they are um, spirit hair. <laughs> honestly. Honestly, I think that's probably one of the most frustrating things about these cases um, is that I don't know that we'll get um, I don't I don't know that the public will get the answers that we want, um, you know, to go back to Amy's statement. Like nobody wants to believe that, um, you know, someone could kill their son or their, um, you know, or their wife or both at the same time. And and and. In, in, in kind of what we do, I've, I've come to the hard reality that sometimes we don't always get the answers that, that we want. Um, I think that the, the jurors, um, when they do speak, um, if they choose to speak, which I'm certain that they will, um, I, I think that they probably formed their opinion when the um, evidence came out about, you know, the videos, which I always thought was the, 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 the best piece of state's evidence, the worst piece of defense evidence. And then, I mean, you know, Metters just calling it home with, you know, he wants to tell you that he lied about a ABC, XYZ, because he lied about it all. And I just thought that that was, you know, and getting the answers as to why or who's here or what happened. Um, I mean, you know, what frustrates me is that I don't know that SLED will learn its lesson. I don't know that any law enforcement agency will learn its lesson that, you know, we could have those answers if things maybe had been done differently. Um, and, and it's the verdicts like these where they're like, they still kind of, I think everybody, I think even matters admitted that there, there were mistakes made, um, which I thought was a very good thing for him to do. Um, 
but I think that that those mistakes are, are going to not get us the answers that we need because certainly we're not going to get them from Alec or his defense team. Um, Steve, to you, Steve Peterson, who is uh, an observer of human behavior as uh, he was the most senior DEA agent in the world when he uh, finally retired from that position. He's also uh, investigating the uh, death, the mysterious death of Stephen Smith back in 2015. But in uh, John Metter's rebuttal, Steve Peterson, this is a direct quote, uh, and he kind of punctuated this. He says, I think he loved Maggie, and I think he loved Paul, but you know who he loved more than that and who he's going to make sure that life wanted to make sure that life. He loved Alex, and he exercised his greatest power of choice to make sure that life continued or try, and he couldn't. Um, that's pretty poignant, too. Um, saying that, look, he may have loved his wife and son, but he loved himself more, um, just goes to show the selfishness of, uh, of a human brain being, uh, you know, married, obviously, but we're talking about his son here. Um, I can tell you, I'd give up my life in a moment uh, for my son. But uh, what do you make of those comments? Well, I thought they were quite eloquent, and I thought they were tr quite true. If you look at Alex's behavior, over the past decade or more, Alex's number one priority is the preservation of Alex and the Murtaugh name, the reputation that his grandfather and his father, his great grandfather created in that part of the state. And here he is tarnishing it all. And I think that was incredibly crippling for him. But even, even Maggie's own sister, she testified that what really turned her is after the death, he didn't show any real uh, emotion when it came to finding out who really killed them. Of course, he already knew. But his biggest concern was clearing Paul's name, clearing the name. And I, I'm assuming related to the beach thing. So it's all about appearance. It's all about controlling the narrative. That's what Alex has done. And he tried to do it throughout this entire trial but he wasn't able to convince the jurors. And, you know, we've had, we've seen a lot of guests on a variety of shows who have been seated, sitting in the courtroom at various times. And what I found fascinating was listening to those people, you got completely different uh, uh, descriptions of how the jury is interacting with the witnesses, especially Alex. Some people said they were crying when he was crying and they, they handed him tissues and, other people said, oh, no, they turned away and couldn't even look at him. So it's impossible, at least from, from my perspective as an outsider, not seeing the jury at all, to read anything into how they're receiving what Alex is saying. But even the people that were there seems they weren't able to read it either. Stephen, when you were, when you were talking about um, you know, watching these witnesses, I, I thought the most powerful witnesses are the ones that we saw come into the realization on the stand. Um, right? Everyone, let's uh, let's tune in. The state is Alan Wilson. The yeah. AG is, I'm going to have all you guys mute if you can. Yeah. This is the state AG, Alan Wilson. Hey. chief prosecutor. I tell you, I, I appointed Creighton Waters to be the chief prosecutor of this case nearly a year and a half ago. And I want to say I'm pretty brilliant because I, I picked the right guy. And I want to say thank you to Creighton Waters. Creighton, you did a fantastic job. I don't think there's another attorney in the state of South Carolina that could have uh, led this Herculean effort. But Creighton will be the first to tell you he didn't do it alone because he had a team of people. I want to first thank Don Zelinka. Uh, who was actually Creighton's boss. He is the deputy attorney general, been in the attorney general's office for over 40 years, sitting here to my immediate left. Don Zelenka, thank you so much. John Metters, many of you got to see him do the closing argument today. Uh, John, thank you. you you've, done a, you've been a phenomenal add to our team. I'm going to go quickly through the names, but the, as I read the names, please raise your hand. You know Creighton, you saw Don, and you see John. David Fernandez, John Conrad, 
Johnny James, Savannah Gal, Ozzy Toledo, yes. Shane Aceto, yes. Carly Jewell, yes. Carson Burney, yes. Danielle Cologne, yes. and our victim's advocate, Trisha Allen. Yes. I also want to say thank you to the South Carolina Law Enforcement Division. Mark Keel uh, assigned some amazing men and women. And when I say it was an agency-wide effort on behalf of SLED, I can't underscore that part enough. Every time I called Chief Keel, every time I reached out to the lead agents, every time Creighton was asking me, hey, General, we need something from SLED, we would reach out to SLED, and they were there. They busted their butts. I can't begin to list every agent. And some can't be listed for obvious reasons. Some are standing up here tonight. I told them I wasn't going to uh, mention their names, but we would not be here if it wasn't for SLED. And I want to thank Mark Keel and his team and all of the men and women across the entire state law enforcement division for what they did to make uh, tonight a possibility. I also want to thank uh, the FBI and the Secret Service, our federal partners. We had to utilize many of their assets and resources. We couldn't do all the things that we did without our federal partners. We had a lot of local partners. We had the Colton County Sheriff's Department, Buddy Hill, Sheriff Hill and his team providing the security. They did a phenomenal job and they were there. They were the first responders the night on June 7, 2021, when Maggie and Paul were butchered brutally. They were the first responders and they were the first ones to be there. Uh, the Charleston Sh uh, County Sheriff's Office, the Orangeburg County Sheriff's Office were instrumental in supporting our investigative efforts. You all know Kenny Kenzie, uh, our chief crime uh, scene expert, was with the Orangeburg Sheriff's Office. Uh, I also want to thank the city of Walterboro. I think the mayor is here somewhere, and uh, the police department, they provided security. Um, thank you. This, this, is, the, this whole community has embraced our entire team, and I cannot thank you enough. Uh, we've all been away from our families, two hours away from our families for the past two months, and it, it's this community that made us. We would walk into restaurants, and people would come up and thank us. You know, you don't have any idea how good that makes people feel when they're under an incredible amount of stress, an incredible amount of uh, scrutiny, and this community really embraced us. I want to thank uh, the Colton County Clerk of Court, Becky Hill, and her entire team and their staff. I don't know. I call her Becky Boo. That's her nickname, but Madam Clerk, wherever you are tonight, <laughs> I'm sorry. That's my that's my pet name for. Her. Uh, but I want to thank you, Madam Clerk, for you, the entire team, the bailiffs, the court security, the staff here. Uh, there there was no role that was too small that they weren't willing to do for us. Uh, the security team here. It was a Herculean er effort by everybody, and I can't I can't thank enough people. Uh, I don't know if I mentioned the bailiffs. Uh, but I want to thank them. And there's another group of people who uh, you don't know who they are, but that's the jurors. And not just the jurors, but the officers, the ones who didn't even get to serve to the very end, but people who were taken away from their families. And I want to thank the families of our jurors who sat here every single day for what seemed like long amounts of tedious, monotonous information and evidence. Sometimes people didn't know what it meant. They didn't understand it. And they had to sit there and process it and hear it over and over and over again. And I want to thank uh, these nameless jurors uh, whose identities have been protected. They may make their identities available to all of you at some point, but they sat there and they delivered justice tonight. And I want to thank them for their role in this process. You know, Winston Churchill said, democracy is the worst form of government except for every other kind. I kind of want to adopt that and say we may have the worst criminal justice system in the world, but it's better than every other kind that there is. And our criminal justice system worked tonight. It gave a voice to Maggie and Paul Murdoch, who were brutally mowed down and murdered on the night of June 7, 2021, by someone that they loved and someone that they trusted. And they couldn't be here to testify for themselves tonight. Their testimony came through the evidence and the information that was gathered by the men and women of the agencies I just mentioned. It came uh, from the testimony of the agents and the investigators and the, and the attorneys and the uh, folks in our staff who were able to get it to the court record. And so I, I want to say tonight, their voice was heard tonight 
and justice was brought for them. We can't bring them back, but we can bring them justice. I started off my remarks by saying that it is a good day in South Carolina. Today's verdict proves that no one, no one, no matter who you are in society, is above the law. A lot of people doubted that this process would work, and hopefully, for those who did doubt the process, hopefully we have instilled and put a little bit of faith back into you and your lives as you view this process as it unfolds. I'm proud of this team. I'm proud of the men and women standing behind me tonight, and there's been a lot of emotion. And I just want to say from the bottom of my heart, I saw firsthand for the last five or six weeks the countless nights when you were up beyond midnight and you were getting up before dawn, not eating. I was watching Nancy Grace the other night and I heard her call Creighton pale and gone because Creighton wasn't eating and sleeping. He really wasn't, folks. I'm, I'm serious. So, you know, we, we would have to bring in kind bars and things to eat during breaks. But Creighton, Herculean effort, my friend. And I, I, am, I am truly honored to have you on our team. Thank you for being a great leader and a great chief prosecutor. And I would like to invite you to come up here and make some remarks for the folks here tonight. Thanks, everybody. And uh, <clears throat> I want to start by thanking this guy who's given me and all these folks behind us uh, opportunities to do justice, which is what we want to do with our careers. Uh, it is uh, very tough and demanding. But it's rewarding for moments like these. Uh, the general stole a lot of my lines, but I also want to thank uh, the jurors for their long and arduous service. And we had no doubt that if we had a chance to present our case in the court of law, that they would see through the one last con that Alan Murdoch was trying to pull. And they did, and we're so grateful for that. I get to, to be uh, the state grand jury section in the attorney general's office. This particular case is not a state grand jury case. There are other indictments that are state grand jury. But the one thing about that is, is that I have an amazing team. And I want to be clear, this was a team effort. Y'all saw all of these folks behind me uh, doing amazing work. And I can't be prouder of a team in my life. We called this our Super Bowl. And not because of the media attention, but just because of the effort that we knew that we would have to put into this. And we didn't really get to watch much of the Super Bowl that went on because when we arrived, I think it was winter and it feels like spring now. But every single member of this team, every single member of the state grand jury staff, what we do well is work together as a team in complex investigations. And who we work with is my partners at SLED. And I can't thank them enough as well because we're used to working on these complex cases and working uh, together. And I'm not leaving out Sheriff Hill, Collinson County Sheriff's Office and our federal partners in Orangeburg and Charleston Sheriff's Office and all the other agencies that work on this case. I also want to thank Ms. Becky. She's still up there because she's been amazing. Uh, the, the clerk staff has been amazing. The court staff has been amazing. The bailiffs have been amazing. And again, I also want to thank this community who really has embraced us and, and has been so great to us and made us able to survive uh, this process that has been long and arduous, and I haven't been sleeping, I haven't, I haven't, uh, and, and I have been eating more than kind bars every now and then, but, and I'm sure that's a nice plug for kind, but anyway, um, it really has been a, a great process, we will have sentencing tomorrow, obviously we're not going to comment on, on sentencing because that's still pending, uh, but justice was done today, it doesn't matter who your family is, it doesn't matter how much money you have or people think you have. It doesn't matter what you think, how prominent you are. If you do wrong, if you break the law, if you murder, then justice will be done in South Carolina. And I think South Carolina has shown the nation and the world how a process can work and work well. Thank you all. And also, I want to thank Creighton. I told Creighton, I said, Creighton, I'm going to come down and I'm going to, I'm going to be just a staff attorney. I know I'm your boss. I'm your boss's boss's boss. But I said, I'm going to come down and I'm going to help. And uh, I said, uh, I'm, going to, I'm going to follow instruction. And uh, I, hope, I hope I was true to my word. 
Um, this past weekend, I said, what can I do to help? I said, uh, I'm willing to take a witness if it'll help. He said, actually, it would. Um, so uh, he, he let an old prosecutor dust off his cleats and get back in the game and, and uh, to help the team out. And uh, I got to be the boss of the boss for a while. Yeah, <laughs> don't get used to it. Um, <laughs> no, but in all seriousness, um, I'm, I'm, I'm proud of the decisions that I made and putting the people behind me to the left and right of me in charge of this case. And I was honored to be part of this team. Just another member, just another worker bee in the trenches trying to bring justice to the people of, 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 this, of this state and to bring justice to the people who couldn't be here tonight because they were brutally murdered by someone they trusted. Now, with that being said, I know a lot of people want to talk to us. A lot of people want to talk to some of the attorneys and the support staff and the agents, investigators here tonight. Some of you want to talk to me and others. We're going to make ourselves available to you. But like Mr. Waters just said, tomorrow there's a sentencing hearing, and we don't want to get out in front of our skis. And plus, I'm starting to feel the rain come down. But I promise you, we're going to make ourselves available to talk to members of the media, to talk to all of you out there that have questions. We'll answer any questions that we ethically can. We hope you'll continue to be patient with us uh, as, as we finish this process tomorrow. Again, we're going to go back and get a good night of uh, sleep tonight. But again, thank you. Also, one last group that we didn't thank, the media. Uh, you, you, you all, I, I know a lot of people in this you know, polarizing world we live in, a lot of people take shots at the media, but the media was incredibly respectful. Uh, you, you were so good, uh, not just to us, but listen, to the families of the victims, okay? I know this is an awkward situation, but, you know, you protected the identities of people and, uh, you know, you, you protected the process, and I want to thank you for your part in this and telling the stories, let, um, educating the public on what's going on out there. So now I'm going I'm to stop speaking as an attorney general, and I'm going to close as a father and as a husband to say that when you go home tonight, hug your loved ones, hug your spouse, hug your children, because this case reminds us of anything that you just you can't take for granted that people in your family are always going to be there. And right now, when I get home tomorrow, I'm going to hug mine, and I hope you hug yours. But thank you again. Thank you for your prayers. Thank you for your prayers. You came and prayed for me. I see a lot of people come and say we're praying for you. We appreciate your prayers. Thank you all so much. And this is going to conclude this press conference. We look forward to talking to all of you tomorrow. Thank you. There he is, the Attorney General. And that was, in fact... Attorney General Alan Wilson. He was taking a, a much deserved victory lap there, um, speaking before the media. Uh, just to recap what he said, uh, basically, uh, you know, he also, by the way, as he mentioned, questioned uh, the state's final witness. He thanked, of course, Creighton Waters, John Metters. Uh, he thanked his entire staff. I think it's notable that both Creighton and Attorney General Wilson also made it a strong point to thank SLED, who criticized uh, widely throughout this entire trial. Uh, he also thanked the FBI, the Secret Service, Collin County Sheriff's Department, uh, who were the first responders on scene, the city of Walterboro. Uh, he said that they were two hours away from their families, uh, essentially for six weeks, and said it meant so much to him when random people came to thank him uh, when they were eating at local restaurants. And uh, both he and Creighton Waters said this, and this is perhaps the most important point of both of their uh, news conferences after this verdict, A.G. Wilson said, no one is above the law, obviously implying that this long reign by the Murdoch family with all their prominence, uh, it wasn't enough to keep Alec Murdoch, who is now convicted of these two heinous crimes, from being uh, found guilty and now uh, likely spending the rest of his life behind bars. Uh, even joking, A.G. Wilson did that Nancy Grace called Creighton Waters pale and gaunt. Um, Creighton Waters then came out and said this is what he wants to do with his career. Uh, he wants to serve justice. He says that's what we did here. Uh, and went on to say, I thought this was elegant and poignant, that jurors saw through one last con that Alec Murdoch was trying to pull off. He, too, thanked the team. Also thanking SLED, both thanking the court clerk, which I thought was uh, funny and well-deserved, but she looked down from what appeared to be a balcony behind them, uh, literally waving out a window. Uh, and he too said, it does not matter 
who your family is, how prominent they are, how much money they have. You are not above the law. Um, Jack Swirling, to you, um, in a state like South Carolina, especially in an area like Collin County, um, which the other day I heard the average education is an eighth grade education. People are mm-hmm. not making the money that criminal defense attorneys are making. What kind of relief do you think this is for this part of the state um, to know that a man of this kind of prominence and wealth um, couldn't get away literally with murder? Well, I think that people who look at people with privilege getting uh, benefits and uh, not being held accountable, uh, they're probably going to feel pretty good about it. Uh, And that's what you have where a lot of people don't have uh, higher education or don't make that kind of money. Um, But if I could, Joe, I'd like to say one thing. I think that the lawyers in this case on both sides uh, made South Carolina proud. Uh, we had the best we have who were up there for the last five or six weeks. Uh, and each one of them is a talented lawyer. I know each one of them. I've tried cases against and with each of them. And uh, so I don't, uh, I, I really don't favor any criticism of any of them. Uh, this is a tough, tough profession. And uh, you, if people think that they can do it and get up there in front of 12 jurors and a nationwide, worldwide TV audience uh, and try a murder case, well, have have at it. I'm going to go around the horn here with the uh, lawyers. Amy Z, uh, you are up. What did you think of these comments from A.G. Wilson and Creighton Waters and the overall performance tomorrow was uh, the end of week six? I think that, um, <clears throat> you know, Alan, Alan, Alan is a politician. I think it was fun for him to be back in the courtroom. Um, it was surprising for all of us and, and good for us to see. Um, you know, I think that it does um, relay. The one thing that I can say that I've seen with my own two eyes, with all of these attorneys involved, um, is that they put in a lot of hard work. And and Creighton and John Netters and, and all the teams, um, Carly, who is their paralegal, who has, you know, really been running the whole thing from behind the scenes she um i was surprised her name didn't get thrown out there but she um is someone who has spent a long time working and um i think anybody who does real trial work can can understand that win or lose there's always this ptsd kind of feeling and um you know sure their comments are relieved and sure they're happy but i can tell you that at some point in the next 48 hours it's going to hit every attorney that participated in this case it's like whew, to start over and and, and to, to try to get back up on the horse amy z uh one of the final things that ag wilson said uh, after thanking the media and they deserve thanks too um you know gg uh, mckelvey has been on our show pretty lies and alibis did phenomenal work. She actually told me, I reached out to her this morning um, after Griffin's uh, closings, and she said that the jurors appear to be much more receptive to him than to Creighton uh, and, I, and John Metters, and I thought that was uh, quite interesting and compelling, and I didn't know what that meant for the outcome. Um, it just goes to show it is very difficult to read people, um, and only those jurors knew Uh, what the outcome would be. But A.G. Wilson at the end said he wanted to close as a father and a husband, and he's going to go home tonight and hug uh, his loved ones. You have two boys. Uh, Amy, are you going to do that tonight? Well, I do that every night, not just on nights when people are convicted or not convicted. Um, Absolutely. I mean, I think this, it just makes us all take like a little bit harder look on what we're doing, what our purpose is, how much we love our families. And maybe I think more importantly, I'm going to go, um, maybe I'll even have sex with my husband tonight for being a wonderful human being, a wonderful father. <laughs> maybe, maybe he'll be the one that gets rewarded and not the kids tonight. You're um, most kids. You're being a lawyer kids. who doesn't kill his family. I'm super grateful for that. Very nice. Uh, Tim, Tim Jansen. Um, you see these, uh, you know, victory parades after uh, a hard fought battle. What did you make of, uh, again, AG Wilson is a politician. 
Creighton Waters was his main man. What did you think? Did anything stand out to you as they uh, spoke to the media after this uh, guilty verdict? Oh, and I have to unmute you again. I'm sorry, Tim. I'm, uh, I'm the control room and the anchor and a lot of different things. But here Am you go. I muted? I, I thought the politician was a little smug. I think he could have had it a little more serious. I think this was a serious matter. I think people lost their lives. And we all agree it was a murder and that you're not going to bring justice back to the people that were murdered. Um, you have to understand you got people on both sides. I thought Creighton was was perfectly adequate in his response. It's a hard job. And like Jack said, trials are difficult. Uh, and they're very stressful on people, a lot of pressure on people. Um, and any defense lawyer can tell you, if you believe your client is innocent, truly innocent, there's so much pressure on you as a lawyer versus you got someone that's got a record and they're just seeing what they can do. Um, I remember one time in the middle of a trial and a younger attorney says, hey, man, that's bad. This is really bad. And I leaned over and I said, listen, man, we don't build the planes. We just fly them. And you have to understand that. Um, in my office, I have a, a, a large picture of Clarence Darrow. And Clarence Darrow said, I protect the rights of others so I can protect my rights. And I try to remember that every day because people always say, how can you defend this person? How? It's the process. It's our system. And I, I commend the lawyers on this case. I think they had some bad facts. And I think the state did a good job. I thought Meadows brought it home pretty well. And that's really the benefit of having that last part of the closing. You're the last one they hear. Sonny Slaughter has joined uh, the panel. Sonny uh, trained law enforcement officers, and she has been in that world for many years. Uh, Sonny, uh, obviously, you're just hopping on now. What was, uh, what was your reaction to the guilty verdict? Uh, it was quick. I've been, you know, on the other shows. It, it, they came back really, really quick. But I, I think it was that short time, that window in there and them going to the actual scene that might have what, whatever kind of, you know, questions they may have had. I think that short time frame and going out there kind of summed it up. But I mean, we all kind of figured that he might be guilty and they 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 tied it up. They tied the knot up. I kept going back and forth. I mean, I knew he's done something, but um. I'm glad that part is over. However, I, I do want to go back to what my colleague was saying. This is really serious. And this is not over for the families. As some, you know, I've done a lot of victims' rights work and services. And I've not only been on the prosecution, but the defense and had have had to hold the hands of a lot of survivors and, and victims and and of course, you know my story. I was also married to a, a perpetrator before. The amount of years that it will take for the families of Maggie and Paul and, you know, Alex's colleagues to get through this. I didn't say get over, but to get through this, um, it's, it's a lot. It is a lot to deal with for the city to go through this. You know, um, my my family's actually from South Carolina. My father's from Yamasee. Uh, so, and that's a very small town in Buford. So all throughout that area, uh, my last name, maiden name is Barnwell. So there are Barnwells all throughout there and they are talking about this. So I, I just hope that the city can recover, the community can recover. And, you know, thank you, Joel, for always jumping in and having such a lens on the importance of uh, recognizing who victims are and, and your colleagues and all of the amazing guests that you bring on your show. Uh, we always have to remember Maggie and Paul. I don't think we've talked enough about Maggie. <laughs> I was kind of wondering, you know, like, did, did we really focus on who she was as a woman, as a mother? I, I don't think we kind of talked about that enough out loud. Yeah, I agree with you. I don't think we talked about the victims nearly enough, but here's one of them from Daniel Malloy. Uh, Amy Lawrence Lovely, I'm going to throw this one to you. Buster's going to have to live like the rest of us now. I would beg to differ here. He is going to live a life of ignominy, as, uh, 
that Daniel Hawthorne once said about uh, Esther, uh, was it Esther Prynne? I'm just blanking on her name. Hester Prynne in uh, The Scarlet Letter. And uh, he's going to have a scarlet letter uh, basically on his chest for the rest of his life. People are going to always point at him, going to say this is the one whose dad killed his mother and brother. Um, I mean, Amy, do you feel for him? Um, do you feel like there will be a point in his life where he'll be able to turn things around? Do you think he can stay in South Carolina? I mean, I think he can do whatever he wants. I think, though, that, like, he still has to live with the fact that, you know, it goes back to what I said before. Like, the re the reality for him is if he doesn't support his dad and say that he didn't do it is that he's got to wrap his mind around that his father would kill his mother and his little brother. And that's a reality that I don't even – I don't really even know these people, and I don't want to live in that world either. You know what I mean? So mm -hmm. imagine if it were your family and your mom and your little brother – so, like, how do you even wrap your mind around it? And if Jerry Spence didn't, like, ever teach me anything else in this world, is that the heaven, your your heart and your head are a million miles away, right? What is what we know and what we feel are sometimes so different. Um, and so he's going to have, I, I, he needs to really, like, dig in. He probably needs to get some counseling, and he's got to figure that out. And how do you move forward from here, you know, here on? And I, nope. it, it breaks my heart for him because we've heard his name come up in the Stephen Smith case. And it's just conjecture, right? It's just rumor. And his whole life, it's like it's like almost people are like um, excited that he's going to have to live like the rest of us now. Like, what does that mean? And where are we at in a society where a, a kid whose mom and brother have been brutally murdered, that we're thinking to ourselves, oh, Buster deserves something more than or less than anyone else we would want for another victim's family. That's where we're like missing the connection of life because rumor and facts are very different. And what all we know for sure is that Buster's mom and brother were brutally murdered. And tonight it's been confirmed that it was by his father. So if we don't have anything but heartbreak and pity and just um, sadness for him, then we've all lost our mark and we all need to go back and do some like really deep thinking. Uh, no better question uh, to ask this of than uh, a Jewish guy from the Bronx who somehow wound up in South Carolina for over 40 years. But I'm curious, Jack, because you are the wise man on the panel here. T. Solace writes, 333, I pray Alec repents and finds Jesus. Mm -hmm. um, I'm just curious what you think of this comment. And you've you've handled many, many murder cases have you ever stayed in touch with any of the people who are convicted? Uh, do you think there is a way to be rehabilitated? He clearly has many, many problems uh, psychologically and otherwise physiological with the drugs, too, going on. But is there any hope at the end of the day for Alec to ever turn stuff around in his life? Well, you're not going to get that hope in, or that treatment uh, for that hope uh, in the Department of Corrections. It just doesn't exist. We have thousands of people who are incarcerated. There are no great programs. Uh, I mean, I know the director of the Department of Corrections, he does everything he can, but money is short uh, and they don't have the programs that are needed. I think Amy could probably bear that out with me. Uh, so uh, I don't know. I, I think most people who go to prison are not rehabilitated or they come out, uh, you know, very tough, very sour, uh, very, uh, angry at the world and so they may not be recidivists but they are they have an attitude about them that uh does, is not healthy uh so i i don't know that you're going to get that out of alex uh because he's not going to have anybody to really talk to he's not going to have anybody who's going to give him any guidance or treatment mm -hmm. so uh, i hope he finds himself um he's going to be spending a long time uh, behind uh, the walls of prison walls in a small cell He's not going to get any privileges, I can tell you that. Yeah. Um, Sonny, what is, because uh, I know you know about this, um, I guess the same question to you, can Alec Murdoch ever be, and I don't want to make this all about Alec Murdoch, obviously, but can is there any hope for him to ever be rehabilitated? And a larger question, I mean, how big a problem is that, what Jack is talking about right now, that there, he basically doesn't have hope because the prison system is so screwy? Wow. Yeah. The, the prison systems are so, uh, first of all, they're overcrowded and then they don't have 
they don't have enough guards in many of the locations. And in order to have services in there, then they have to have individuals who are willing to go into the prison to provide those types of services, because that's kind of an external component of it. And then you have to have the right people who are qualified to do it as well. And and as, as our wise man already said, it is not happening in the way that it really should in most of the prisons. And Alex won't receive any special treatment. And what he's going to do. Now, he spent a short amount of time, ironically, uh, I should say, overcoming his so-called drug addiction. That wasn't a very long time for someone that had a, a, a an extremely long addiction. So when you think about how long he's going to be in prison, if he does not get himself together, I'm not sure that there's going to be hope. But he's already tried to kill himself. I just don't think that he's going to find the type of support and services that he might need behind the walls, as what as what we always say. Tim Jansen, this is next comment from Ann Vroom, who has quickly become a friend of the show and uh, is on here almost every night. Where's Tricky Dicky? Obviously talking about Dick Harputlian. Guess, and by the way... Jack Swirling was a former partner at Dick Harputlian. I always point out Jack's name came first on the marquee, but the question to you, Tim, where's Tricky Dicky? And then Jack, I'll get your take. Guess he's in the backseat of his limo, leaving a trail of dust out of swamp country, I think is what they meant to say. Tim, my question to you, um, you've been on both sides of this. You're a criminal defense attorney. You've won cases. You've lost cases. Uh, how difficult is it? picking yourself up and dusting yourself off after a loss, especially when it is a case of this magnitude, because that will now be his legacy. That ha is how people are going to remember him uh, when they think of Dick Harputley, and there's no way around it. Well, not many people have cases of this magnitude. Um, my understanding, he was a personal friend. He knew Alec also, which makes it a little more complicated when you represent a personal friend on the stage like he did um, at his age, not that his age is anything, but he did the right thing. I don't think he had a press conference. I don't think he said anything. I think normally what you normally say at that point is that we respect the, the verdict and we're gonna, <coughs> the decision. but you, there's no thing for him to say at this point. He probably talking to the family members of Alec, maybe Alec's brother and them talking about what they're gonna do. And right now he's probably preparing for sentencing, seeing if he's gonna have any witnesses for sentencing tomorrow. Um, they chose to do it really quickly. <laughs> Creighton wanted it early. Mm -hmm. um, because of the victim laws now, normally a judge would have sentenced him right there and then. Um, I would expect he's going to give him a life sentence based on the horrific murders of two people and that he obstructed, he possibly perjured himself in his trial, mm -hmm. um, did all he could to obstruct justice. So um, I don't think Harputlian is going to get out there and say much. I really don't. And Tim, will that be life without parole? Uh, it would be in Florida now. I don't know what it's like in South Carolina. I think it is. Um, Jack, to you, will that be life without parole? And also yes. your friend Dick Harputlian. Um, this will be his legacy. He lost his case. Um, is it going to be hard for him to take this on the chin or, uh, or no? You know him best. Well, I mean, I do know him best. And I've known him for almost 60 years. Uh, we've been friends that long. Uh, he's going to rise above it. He's had many, many uh, uh, mountains that he's climbed and uh, he's had many, many victories. And uh, so, you know, he's going to just have to deal with this one. And I'm sure right now he and Jim are sitting there evaluating, you know, the defense that they put up. Uh, they work very hard. I mean, I, their, his offices are right near mine, just a block away. Uh, I know they worked hard. And so, you know, there is always regret and there's always, uh, you know, could I have done this different? Uh, but, you know, these two lawyers are very sharp and uh, they they got, uh, like I've always said to you, uh, Joel, Dick has a very sharp mind, but he always has a, he also has a very sharp tongue. And uh, he has kept me laughing for almost 60 years. So, you know, I think a few days from now he'll be, uh, when I sit down breakfast or lunch with him, he'll have a couple of zingers for me. That, that was my next question when your uh, lunch or dinner is. And I want to be invited not to the to the first one after this, but one of the ones down the road, I'll take an invite, uh, Jack. Me but too. You're invited. 
Sonny <laughs> wants Sonny wants everyone wants in on this. Yeah. Um they say that they're great, out. I think. Don't you think, Joel? Say again, Sonny. I didn't mean to cut you off. I think he did really good with his uh cross examination of the expert witnesses. He really got under their skin. Yeah, I mean he did <laughs> He, he did yeoman's work, like Jack said. I mean, there's no doubt that they prepared and did all their work. Um, they came up short. There's always got to be a winner, you know, and a loser. And uh, he definitely lost. And the odds were stacked against him with this case, I think. Mm -hmm. um, there's a comment that uh, people are holding. Here it is. Crowd at the court house holding signs that say justice. And justice has been served tonight. Sonny, I was going to throw this comment to you from Rose. There's a huge disconnect between the educated classes in America and the less educated classes in America. The opinion of the more educated classes of the less educated classes need a reality check because there are people saying, look, uh, from what we were told, it was like an eighth grade average education in Carlton County. Um, these people, um, from what we know about them and the decision they make, seem to have uh, their head screwed on on their shoulders in the right manner. And it appears that they uh, presented a very just verdict, but any thoughts on this comment here? I think um, there are a lot of people who are not informed. I won't say educated. I will say less informed about the criminal justice systems and how they interact and how those inner workings uh, play out. I just really think that shows like yours and other shows and being able to watch these play out in court cases help uh, inform juries. But I'd also believe that uh, we need to talk about juries and the judicial process in schools. Children need to learn this. This needs to be a part of the educational process when they are uh, not just in about to graduate from high school, but going all through high school. What does this look like in cases? So they have a better understanding as, you know, so they can serve as effective and informed jurors and um, about what the process looks like, because I don't think people really understand how difficult it is. And, and when you have a client like Alex, um, it makes it even more difficult when you have all these complex nuances. Um, Amy Lawrence, to you from Sasha Brady, the big question now is will counties like Carlton clean up their act? I mean, Amy, before we even get to that question, do you mm -hmm. think that there's an issue in South Carolina? You live there with corruption. And if there is, will this help to, uh, as Sasha um, is alluding to, clean all that mess up? Yeah, I don't, I don't think that places like Carlton County and, and what was going on with the Murdoch family are rare, not just in South Carolina, but in America, right? Mm -hmm. And and that's the, that's the real issue. And the good thing that comes of all this is that it's you know that of which we do not acknowledge, we cannot change. And so mm -hmm. this case has brought to the forefront that no one's above the law, even when we all thought that they were. And I think that's I think that's important that we all take a deep, long look at the areas you know in our country, not just in South Carolina, but in every county across across the country, and say you know it's not okay and it's got to stop, and and we're going to start holding people accountable. Uh, this comment here from Angela Philbrook, party at the judge's house tonight, LOL. Uh, Jack, back to you, and then I like Tim's take on this as well. Um, probably the most likable character in this whole trial is Judge Clifton Newman. I know you know him. Um, what did you think of the work he did over this six weeks in controlling this entire trial? Well, I mean, he's had a lot of experience. Uh, he's very sharp. He's no nonsense. He doesn't, he doesn't play favorites. I mean, he holds the state to the same standard as he holds to the, holds the defense. Uh, and so he doesn't tolerate any kind of, uh, you know, playing around in his courtroom or any kind of sarcasm uh, or any anybody stepping out of line. Uh, but uh, I think most most lawyers that I know who are trial lawyers uh, in this state find that he's a fair judge. Uh, and a fair judge is someone who, in my opinion, gives both sides the benefit of the doubt and uh, lets them try their case uh, and, uh, you know, it doesn't criticize them in front of the camera or in front of a jury. 
Uh, and that's Judge Newman. He's he has by the way, his daughter is a judge too here uh, in Columbia. And so he comes from a long line of uh, people uh, who are very well known in the Columbia area. And uh, you know, he's going to be retiring this year. Uh, you know, I think we're not going to we're not going to appreciate his retirement. Uh, we'd like to keep him on the bench, but uh, <laughs> his, daughter, his daughter's there, and uh, I'm sure she'll step in and, and take over and. Uh, his legacy. The, the one thing that we really love about Judge Newman is that he has temperament, right? And we don't, we, not all judges have that. And that's what makes him so great. He's, he's, he's not frazzled. He doesn't put up with any bullshit. He's right down the middle. And that is always like refreshing and awesome to experience when you have a judge. He, he was very serious throughout the trial. I mean, there was no gamesmanship. Uh, yeah. He knew what his job was and you know, way back in the day when Susan Smith was tried here, it was the same time that OJ was being tried out in California. And one of my classmates, Bill Howard, was the judge. We didn't have anything like what happened out in California. Uh, these judges in South Carolina are trial lawyers. They came from the trial bench, uh, the trial bar, uh, and they know what it takes to be a fair and impartial judge. By the way, speaking of that, uh, O.J. Simpson, of all people, was on Twitter today commenting yeah. about the Alec Murdoch trial, complaining, of course, injecting himself, speaking about narcissism, complaining about how long he was sentenced to prison for his uh, armed robbery case. So <laughs> that is the circus that is sometimes the United States of America. Um, Joe, have you found the killer yet? That's what I'm curious about. <laughs> um, <laughs> But if he did it, he'll tell us how he did it. Exactly. Um, Tim, if that's so <laughs> um, what's it like to work with a judge who's not like Clifton Newman, who doesn't take control and uh, lets things just run amok like Judge Ito did in the OJ trial? Mm. Well, defense lawyers like that. Um, and I've seen the opposite where you have a former prosecutor, a state judge who thinks he's a federal judge. Uh, they'll admonish you in front of your client, in front of the juries. Uh, very difficult, not easy to try cases with them. You're on your heels the whole time. You're always afraid he's going to hold you in contempt. Um, shows favorites. We had one federal judge one time that the federal government didn't even have to object. He would say sustained. And then if the defense objected, he'd say not on those grounds. <laughs> Overruled. Um, he was he was a Nixon appointee. He um, he one time at one of his last cases, he was like 90 years old, sentenced my client to like 60 years and said, I'm going to run it consecutive to your state charge. The state charge was still pending. And I said to the judge, judge, I don't think you can do that. He goes, well, you can appeal me. So it's always a benefit when you have a fair judge. And if they're calling balls and strikes like it's like a like an umpire. If you don't know they're there, that's the best judge. And I think Judge Newman did a great job. He, he kept it going. Nobody tried to pull punches. And he's no Judge Edo, that's for sure. Dr. Roger Rhodes has joined the panel. He was on, I believe, last night. I've lost track of time at this uh, point in the evening. But uh, Dr. Rhodes, great to see you. He is a therapist dealing in uh, dysfunction within family. There's obviously plenty within the Murdoch family. Ooh, buddy. Um, to you, uh, Dr. Rhodes, your reaction to the verdict, the most obvious question of the evening. Boy, it says a lot about the conviction from the community. That, that just stunned me because it was not just a legal guilty. It was a South Carolina guilty. And that I would have never expected that to happen. But I just think he... Uh, would pass his goodwill in that community. And they just said enough. And so they just sent him on. He was going to be in jail forever anyway. So I think it was much more of a moral mandate than a legal mandate. And Dr. Rhodes, I think I, I don't want to, you know, put you out there and uh -huh. air your, uh, your dirty laundry from last night, but I think you said it was going to be a hung jury, right? So you are, are you surprised that not only did they return with a guilty verdict, but they did it in under three hours. And these are people that you thought might be intimidated by the Murdoch family, but apparently not. Oh, we absolutely, hundred percent not. They sent, they sent a mandate out. They said, 
it, rather than guilty, what they really said was enough, enough. We've looked, at, let's not act like Alex hadn't, been, Alex hadn't been a problem for years in that community, that he hadn't been a liar for years that they knew. He hadn't been, a, he'd been a thief for years. He'd been ugly to other people. So it really wasn't a verdict about whether he had done it or not. It was really about, we've had enough of you. You're done. And bye. And uh, I, I would have been, I was really surprised because I thought there would be a lot of fear about the idea of retribution in such a small area of South Carolina. And do you think that gives a sense of relief to uh, people in the community or around South Carolina or around the world for that matter, who may feel intimidated by those with more power, prestige and money that they are not above the law? Do you think it is a collective sigh of relief tonight? I think payback is hell. And we saw it, we saw it today. I mean, it, it was a mandate. It was a mandate. I couldn't believe it. Uh, like I, when I said last night, I thought they'll mill it around and they'll be intimidated. And, uh, you know, back in the day, even if you brought up the word murder in that area, they whispered it. That's how much influence he had. Um, Amy Lawrence Lovely, this question here by Callie Carolyn. Why no mention of appeal by defense? Was that previously decided to not appeal? Is it too premature? I'm not a lawyer. I have no idea. It seems very premature. And I thought I did hear uh, some quick mention of it um, in passing. But uh, Amy, explain that to the people who are not attorneys. Yeah, they, they made their motions. And what they'll do is they'll file a notice of appeal within 30 days and all that will come out. But that's just a standard thing. We're not going to hear about that right after a verdict and he has not been sentenced yet, which is really rare. I mean, I've gotten a verdict back at 11 o'clock at night and we were sentencing immediately. Um, I do think it's really good that we're waiting till tomorrow um, because I think all of our heads are about to explode at this point after <laughs> six weeks of, of this mess. Um, and I think we all kind of pun intended hung our hat on a hung jury in this situation. Um and, and so I think, and it gives the opportunity for those family members and stuff to be there of the victims. And if they want to speak that they can, and I think they deserve, because you know, Sonny, I think you said it best. We didn't hear any, we didn't hear much about Maggie, right? We've heard from her sister, but you know, that was somebody's daughter and that was somebody's mom and that was somebody's sister. And somebody needs to get up and, and, and speak for Paul and Maggie and what their loss means and what that loss feels like. Um, and so I think it's really good that we're going to send it tomorrow. I think that was a really good choice on, on Judge Newman's part. But the appeal stuff is just um, that will come later. And believe me, there will be an appeal. And anybody who thinks that Alec Murdoch does not have money still has lost their damn minds. Amen. Um, uh, I know that his dad died. I've always said this. I've always wondered, and, and I, I haven't been able to really say it out loud. I, I really wanted to call Creighton in the middle of this trial and ask him this, but I didn't because I'm a um, good citizen and a good lawyer that's not going to do this, but I want to know what Randolph's trust looks like because as a lawyer, um, I, I, so my parents um, have a generation skipping trust, right? So I've always thought, what does Randolph's trust look like? And the reason why I say that is, is so my parents have given me stock. They have a company and I have stock in their company. And when they die, everything else goes to their grandchildren equally, all eight grandkids. Right? So I've always thought to myself, like I, I didn't think that this whole thing of like a financial thing of brewing was really the motive. I thought the motive was always that they had to die before Randolph was dying. That Paul may have been left money in a trust by his grandfather. Cause they keep talking about Buster's trust, right? I've heard that in the news. And so it, so did Paul need to predecease Randolph for his dad to take his part? Because that's what would happen in my family with, with my parents' trust. And I wonder if anybody's ever looked at that, because that's the kind of things that that run through my head and people who aren't used to generational wealth and think and probate matters. And I do a lot of personal injury and stuff. And so I'm helping people make plans when we get big verdicts and settlements. These are the things I'm thinking about. So these, but but let me just rest assured, Alec Murdoch has money one way or the other. He's got it. He's paying Dick Carpoolian because Dick Carpoolian is not cheap. We know this, right, Jack? Uh yeah. And so he's got money and somebody's paying him. He will not do without his appeal, I'm sure. 
And Sonny, you wanted to jump in? Is, wait a minute. What he's forgetting, and they're talking about a lot about law and money. Uh, as long as Mason is making jars and people put them in jars and bury it, I guarantee you, I'd be doing some looking for jars in that area of the country. Well, don't you think it's weird? Like, so I'm a weirdo who listened to all nine hours of the Joe House calls, <laughs> and I swear to God, they're talking in code. Hey, you want to go? You want to go put feet? Why are we trying to put feet out in, in a in a <laughs> barrel where nobody's hunting and the property's sold or not sold and almost sold? Like, you know what I mean? So, yeah. That this is the deal. We saw an accountant with a gun get up there and testify that he stole millions of fucking dollars and nobody said where it went. Amen. Bo, that's a big deal. That is yeah. at the core of what we've seen here. And to invoke the, uh, just real sorry. quick, to invoke the words of Pink Floyd, I think we're all <laughs> feeling comfortably numb and it's a weird night. So if anyone you know needs to jump off, uh, I, love, I want you guys to stay on. I'm going to go a little longer to try to address STS Nation questions here. Sonny, go for it. I, I didn't mean to cut you off. Oh, you're muted. You got to unmute yourself. All right. I'm sorry. I was, um, so, because I did pro weight work in Alabama. I worked for the, um, uh, for Arthur Shore's daughter, and uh, he he was a long-time civil rights person. So I did a lot of pro weight work, and I was thinking the exact same th thing. What was the pass-through for them in setting up the trust and what would that look like going to the because they never did get into the weeds of that and i think there was a reason i'm also wondering if buster will get up and say anything tomorrow no oh. i'd be shocked i'd be shocked um i'd be shocked if anybody gets up because man there, there's layers of family still in the area you know well, I think it goes back to what I was saying earlier. I think the best witnesses in this whole trial were Mark Ball, Miss Shelley, mm -hmm. Mary and the sister, because mm -hmm. we were watching them come to this realization in real time mm -hmm. on the stand after watching the trial that he may have done, like the realization that I think this happened. I think this, I think yeah. he did it. Yeah. And that was like the real, like, that was like the real, real authentic shit that we were seeing in person and, and in real time that mm -hmm. they were coming to this thing and they were struggling with it so hard. I mean, we could see Mary and the sister, like looking just like her sister, mm -hmm. uncanny, talking about coming to this realization that she thinks that maybe he did it. And it's, and it's a real struggle for her. And even Mark and, Ball, you know? Yeah. And, and Shelly, like, she couldn't even get through it. She was just like, she was so choked up. She was like, because they're good people. And I believe a man, man they love forever. Yeah, yeah. I, I think I just. That could funny. have been a fatal flaw, too, because Alec Murdoch at one point basically called her a liar. And she yeah. was probably the most likable witness throughout the six weeks. So, did, did Joe, you with your permission, I'm going to jump off. I've been in court all day and I got to be in court tomorrow. Jack, you're a legend in my eyes and in the eyes of all South Carolinians. Thank you so much for being here. And uh, we all bow down. Amy Lawrence is bowing down. Uh, thank thank I, will, uh, I will be available anytime you want. And I want to thank you. Uh, you do a great show and you bring in great guests. And it's very educational and people get to express their feelings. So thank you for inviting me on. Thanks, Jack. We'll have you back soon and uh, look forward to it. Thanks so much. Bye. See you, Jack. And just like that, we're five. Um, <laughs> so I want to get to this question here. I think this is interesting. Uh, Roger, mm -hmm. I'm going to throw it to you, Dr. Rhodes. Mm -hmm. From Paula Dion, not to be confused with Celine. The jury <laughs> convicted him because he was rich and still stole from people. It does not make him a murderer. There are going to be people out there now, uh, Dr. Rhodes, who say he didn't do this. What say you? It doesn't matter, is what I say. Uh, he He's going to live in jail, and he's going to have money, and he's still going to be influential. And uh, if he needs to get to people, I don't care where they put him, he's going to find a way. He's, he's associated with people that know how to get it done. And so uh, I was just fascinated by a small community 
that was for years influenced by that family sending out very clearly, done. That's really what it was. It's not guilty, but done. We don't want you. We're not going to listen to you anymore. And so uh, I, I really see it as a liberation jury moment. You know, we're, we're liberated from the oppression of the Murdoch is really what I would call this whole thing. Uh, Tim, I thought this was really interesting. The biggest question after six weeks is still why? Three simple words, why? And John Metters today in his rebuttal for the state, one of the very last things he says, and this is a quote, I don't know why he killed his wife and son. I think he did it to protect the one he loved most, the one he really loved the most, so he could keep his lifestyle and not be embarrassed financially. And that is implying it is Alec Murdoch himself was that a powerful line? Because if you're a juror, you're going, oh, my God, this guy loved himself more than he loved his own son. Oh, I think the jury knew, knows that he loved himself. When you heard he took money from those people, the, the poor twin underage people, the, house, the housemaid's kids, that he stole all that money. Um, it's difficult in cases. I've represented some very wealthy, one of the wealthiest guys in Florida. And everybody says, uh, you're, no one's above the law. In that case, I was saying no one's below the law. <laughs> because we can't hold people just because they have money, success, and, and we can't hold them lower the standards. Now, in this case, I know everybody wanted to hold, hold him. No one's above it. But we got to be careful there because we don't just want to convict successful people because they're successful. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that's what happened in this case. Um, motive, really, you don't need a motive. You look, why do people go in and shoot people in the middle of the day? They don't know. There's no motive. They still killed them. And I think the defense tried to get in on that. But the jury, people, jurors, you won't believe how jurors think. They're not stupid people. They may have a fourth grade education, but they can tell when someone's lying. They can tell when someone does somebody wrong. And they believe that he lied and he committed the crimes. And I think 10 years from now, We'll see this on an FBI thing. It's going to be how technology, the perfect murder, was solved by technology Snapchat. Mm -hmm. yeah. And he had the perfect everything except for the Snapchat. Yeah. He didn't consider that. And that's yeah. what tripped him up. And he got caught like a uh, dog with his tail between the legs, uh, mm -hmm. just like that dog with the problem with the tail at the kennels uh, when he – had to admit that he was there. I think that was a very damning moment um, during his own testimony. Marie Hernandez writes, I'd like to get Sonny's take on this, followed by Dr. Rhodes on these next two comments coming up here. Marie Hernandez writes, the love of money is the root of evil. Seems fitting in this case. Marie, don't ever come to Miami. Um, <laughs> Caroline Ciano writes, victory for our country, that elitism Hasn't won yet. I mean, Sonny and Dr. Rhodes, there is a real disparity. You know, they always say that, you know, the rich get richer and the poor get poorer. And it seems like that divide is growing in this country. Bigger than just the Alec Murdoch case here, uh, Sonny, was this a small victory in some way for uh, those who are not at the elite uh, echelons of society, those who are working class people just trying to get by? Does this give them some hope that uh, life is fair? Well, I, I don't know if it gives them hope because he was rich, but hope because he was guilty and he was actually found guilty in spite of him being rich. I, I think that um, the jury was realistic about the issue and, um, and they saw through, I, I don't know, because they're from the town, I don't think they were as focused much on the um, on the finances, not in the way that we might be thinking about it, but they were really thinking about the murder, I, I think so, because they tied it in really quickly. I mean, less than three hours, they really focused on what happened. The wrong phone got thrown. You know, they couldn't find Maggie's phone, but it was really Paul's phone that made the connect that connected the dots really quickly for them. So Maggie's phone being taken and removed from the scene was not really the thing. And um, I think the people, it wasn't 
about the money. Uh, I don't even think it was about the lies because they knew he was a liar. I think it was about the murder of these two people and how heinous it was. Uh, Dr. Rhodes, to you, same same comment for you from Carolyn Ciano. Victory for our country that elit elitism hasn't won yet. Is this trial bigger than just the trial? Is this a commentary on our society here in, in the United States? Yeah, yes and no. Uh, the people who are worshiping the Murdoughs, now the Murdoughs are gone. If you don't think they're going to find somebody else to worship, they're going to do that. And in a whole with a large portion of people not having, they will always look to the haves mm -hmm. and they will always look for justice. Uh, man, that's been around for a thousand years. Do I think this case settled that? No. Mm -hmm. You know, it just moved the, the uh, uh, place of worship, the person of worship. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just the same thing like with Paul and the uh, boat accident. You know, pe people were willingly getting into that and they had had enough. And if you don't think this weekend people are getting in a boat with somebody who's got something in that area and getting drunk up, well, you've missed the boat. Mm -hmm. that's, not, that's not the way it works. Dr. Rhodes, so, you, you came in a little late, but we were talking about how Buster is a victim in all this. Uh, um yeah. Oh, I'm sorry I wasn't there. I would have jumped in and said, you got to be kidding me. All right. No, no. Tell me because I'm, cur I'm curious because um, there are a lot of people that don't like the guy. A lot of people think he is responsible for Stephen Smith's death. We had yeah. Steve Peterson on before you got here uh, yeah. who's investigating for uh, Stephen Smith's family. What, what, do you, what do you have to say about Buster? Buster, not so good with school. He's a cheater. Mm -hmm. uh, but he knows how to follow the family rules and he will smile and have a flat affect. And in a week, he'll have a lot of money in the bank and he'll be living large in Columbia or some other place in South Carolina. He's not going back to that area. He's not going to be around those people. And in a week or so, South Carolina won't remember it. So do you, do you think I, he's, I do you think he's suffering? Do you consider him a victim? No. Now, I mean, is he sad that his mother and his brother are gone and his dad's in jail? Yeah. Uh, but, you know, he's been through other adversities. And uh, he was already on some level moving on with the girlfriend and living somewhere else. Uh, so now he's well financed and doesn't have to kowtow to the crowd. He just needs to get away from the crowd. And do I feel sorry for Buster? No, I don't feel sorry for Buster. He's a Murdoch, you know. How do you describe the dysfunction of the Murdoch family? Generational. They, they didn't just wake up one day and get weird. They've been weird for a while. Before that woman ever married Alex, weird. Before the kids came into the plan, weird. <laughs> they, were, they were raised weird. So if you say they're weird, I'm going to go, yeah, and? Yeah. My, my dad is a retired psychiatrist, and uh, he's, I think he would say something very similar. He's, he bet, my dad is not, uh, quote, unquote, uh, a normal shrink, but I don't think Dr. Rhodes is either. I like oh, that. Oh, man, uh, let me tell you. If, no, you if you find normal, it won't be close to me. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Rhodes is cold. I, yeah, he is cold. But I, kind of, I, I like it. I lo yeah. I like it. I'll tell you about Dr. Rhodes. He's a duck therapist. If it looks like a duck and it quacks like a duck and it swims like a duck, it's a duck. He, is, he is honest. I like that. That's for sure. Cassidy Hill writes, uh, Amy, this is for you. Very simple here. They were not fooled by the BS. Um, what, what do you think, and we'll find this out. I'm sure we will. But what were the one or two or three things that convinced this jury, or was it just one thing, that Alec Murdoch uh, did kill his wife and son? I mean, th this, this is the thing. I, I came into this with like a really open mind, right, as I watched everything unfold. And it goes back to what I said, like, we don't want to believe that people would kill their family like this, right? But I found myself trying to explain away not just one thing or two things, but like a gazillion things. 
And the, the reality of it is, is that's not real life, right? We don't, if we don't, you shouldn't have to like explain away 30 things. And, you know, it's the videos. And it, for me, it was the GMC records, right? When that came in, which I can't believe that uh, they did not object to, to come in after the trial had already started. That just blows my freaking mind. Um, they obviously had not read them. Um, they had the defense attorney. Um, but it, for me, it was, it was, it's the bit, it wasn't even the Snapchat video. It was the kennel video and the, and then the GMC records, right? Mm -hmm. We see his car slow down where the, where the phone gets thrown. I remember. And for me, it was also Miss Shelley, right? In the very beginning, I looked at my husband as we're watching this trial, who's a lawyer. And I said, and I could tell I loved her immediately. Right. Mm -hmm. I knew I loved her. And I looked at him and I said, I think everything about this case is going to change for me in this witness. And he looked at me like I was crazy. And you see in her struggle, because something happened in that moment with him that she and she loved him. Right. He was a good man and a good family. But something felt so wrong about it that she literally picked up the phone and called her, her brother, who's a police officer, to tell him about it. And so, like, when you put all these things together, you don't have to con you can't just explain away fucking everything. There's mm -hmm. not a it's one thing to explain away one thing, but not a hundred things. Mm -hmm. And I really believe it's the kennel video. He lied about it. It puts him at the scene. Mm -hmm. um, it's a, and his reason for lying sucks, right? Because mm -hmm. I really thought that they were going to go with the defense of, I mean, the, if I were defending this case, I would have done a lot of things differently. But one of the things that like I was really surprised with is that they didn't say, do you feel responsible? Like he still went with, it was the boat case people. Like, you know I mean, this is why my family was killed the boat case. The answer is, is I've shit a lot of people. I've bought a lot of fucking drugs and my, my family paid the ultimate price for my shit. And I am, I am responsible for the death of my family. Did I pull the trigger? No. But when mm -hmm. he got up there and he said that shit about the boat case, it's mm -hmm. because they did get killed because of the boat case because he killed them. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And when he got up there and started explaining away every little thing and looking at him, oh, Mr. Walters. I mean, he was the best lawyer in the room. I think we can all agree, right? In that yeah. moment. But it was mm -hmm. bullshit. And guess what? This is what I know about juries. They know authenticity and they can call bullshit from a mile away. And that was bullshit. Yeah. Hey, Joel. We, yes, sir. I think the underlying thing that everybody, uh, any juror would know, he didn't act like a father or a husband who had just pulled up and seen his child killed, shotgun. Yeah. He'd still be holding that child if he loved him like Snot he did. All over He'd him. be holding his Bloody. wife. He would have blood all over his body. He would, and he wouldn't be calling his friends and no. ro He'd be holding those babies, trying to get them help. He didn't act like someone that was Megan a victim. got to take you to and bury That's me right exactly beside right. of them. Yeah, they knew that he didn't act like a victim. I yeah, have blood on my fingertips. Yeah, he acted like a defendant that was trying to have alibis. Yeah, yeah, I have blood on my fingertips. That I never got. I mean, that was one of the most absurd things I've ever heard. Yeah, yeah, and and, and you're right. He would have he would have been holding his child. He would have been holding Maggie. Not he would have blood. been screaming, and there is no way that he would have been clean. He was not dirty. He did not get on the ground. I'm a former EMT, and you are rolling people over. He did not even attempt to save them, even if he, I don't care how many times they were shot, you would have still attempted to save them. No CPR, no nothing, dragging them together, looking around, screaming, out. He had none of that in the car. None. Jurors know that. Jurors know. Yeah. If there's, I guess, I uh, I'm sure, a couple of those jurors had kids. And well, Lord, Stephen Stephen Peterson. The other night we were talking. He there was a shooting in his apartment complex, and uh, when he lived, in, was it Charlotte? Was it? They were saying Joel. He was telling us a story, and he said, "I didn't even know the guy. I ran in." jumped on and started like doing it because I was covered yeah. and I'm sitting yeah. there doing CPR on the guy trying to save him screaming for help. And I didn't even know the man. Yeah. That's what you do. Mm -hmm. and, and imagine it being your own, like your own child and your own wife, the one that you adore and love. I, like I said, I'd have still have snot and blood and rocking mm -hmm. and asking dear God to take me to and bury me with them. Right. right? I yeah. sure as fuck would be calling Rogan. <laughs> 
common sense did not add up at the end of the but day. But you know what also they didn't talk about in trial? They didn't talk about when they went to search, uh, uh, when they went to search Paul's house that he shared with Rogan. Guess what was missing from his house? The door was standing wide open, like somebody had broken in, and his laptop was gone. Nobody talked about that in trial. Don't you think that's weird? Why didn't they? Why didn't they? Yeah. Dude, there are so many things. Nobody talks about his brother, John Marvin, from what I understand, taking a uh, boat to the Bahamas 12 days after the yeah. murders. Yeah. Who These takes things- a boat? And I'm not talking about a cruise ship. I'm talking about a boat. Who takes a boat to the Bahamas? They will come, this will all come out, I believe. Jay Thomas reset. Tim, this one's for you. Uh, I agree 100% with Jack Swirling, who left the panel. Uh, I don't relish an attorney's job. Tough job, but attorneys are a necessary evil. LOL. Now let's all go eat dinner together. Uh, do you take issue with this comment, Tim, or do you uh, agree with uh, Jay Thomas reset? Oh, I think that um, that's absolutely correct. Um, I've had some really tough trials and with prosecutors and you don't make it personal. Um, you are friends with them. You have to deal with them on a daily, monthly, yearly basis. Um, it's not easy and you have to put it down and pick up the next case. Um, when I was a prosecutor, I had a lot of power. Now as a defense lawyer, I have a lot of responsibility. Mm. It's two mm. different, two different scenarios. Oh, that's um, good. You're not representing just your your client. You're representing his family, yeah. his kids, everyone in his family. Mm-hmm. Um, I know one time my daughter came home and she goes, Dad, I don't know who you're winning or who you're representing, but all of Tallahassee is counting on you. I was representing Jameis Winston at the time. Wow. And that, that's the first time she came, Dad, you better win this case. <laughs> so there was a lot of pressure even more so because I went to the university of Florida. Mm -hmm. And so I was getting all these Florida state people want to know why we have a Gator representing our Heisman trophy candidate. Mm -hmm. Um, So I took great pride that FSU gave that much courage and trust in me. Mm -hmm. And I, I lost some Gator friends after I represented him and no charges. They were like, how can you do it? And I said, let me ask you something. Mm -hmm. When you go to your doctor, do you ask him what school he went to? Or do you ask him, hey, I'm peeing blood or whatever? You yeah. don't. You're you're a professional. You're doing your job. Mm-hmm. And Tim Jansen does a great job. Uh, Sasquatch Sa- Saga here. Paul convicts him from the grave. Rest in peace now, Paul. Um, mm-hmm. To you, Dr. Rhodes, what about the irony? But before you answer that, I'll double it up for you here. Oh, but, um, okay. Stuart Bowen. Junior writes, just came out of mass, praying for AM and all the people he heard, especially Maggie and Paul. I think one of the interesting things, whenever there's tragedy, and this is an awful story all the way around, there always appears to be some good out. I always think back to 9-11. I worked at the World Trade uh, Center, not in one of the two towers, but in World Fi- Three World Financial at the time, uh, on the day of 9-11. Our country has gone so the much the other way i'm not getting into politics but a horrible event brought people together um i don't know a a verdict like this and seeing the type of person alec murdoch is this guy could just be you know basically uh figuratively spitting on him right now instead he came out of mass praying for him what does that say about uh people in general it it says there are some honestly good people and I think that's part of what we saw today. I, I think we saw r- real, loving, genuine people having more influence than the studied professional lawyers who were on point the whole time. They were just on the wrong team. <clears throat> Lee Lee writes, or Leia Leia, but I think it's Lee Lee. Amy Lawrence Lovely is the best uh, i agree with that she can be uh explicit at times but uh it's she a coping is the mechanism. Best. that's what my what's what my therapist said it's a coping mechanism my cursing <laughs> girl mine too <laughs> and i'm from we a lot of shit okay we see a lot of stuff Look, I'm a Jersey girl, so oh, it just buddy. come out all mad. Yeah, I gotta keep it real. This is this is tough for good old Southern Baptists here. So 
I don't know, you know. But, in the hey, name of, well, I, mean, just, you know, I went just to my call preacher. a shovel a damn spade, and I think there's <laughs> two of them here. I went to my I went to my Southern Baptist preacher when, when I was like uh, right out of law school, and I was like, I, I prayed. I need I need to quit cursing. Like I can't stop. And today, me, I don't think Jesus gives a shit. That's what he said. <laughs> <laughs> I pray all the time, though, not to. I, I always say I said I, I was I cut down to at least ten a day, but then you I realized good. that was you ten in the one conversation yeah. that I had with one person. So help me. But yeah, Sonny. So Dr. Rhodes um, answered a question similar to this by saying it doesn't matter. But we're going to get these comments uh, for the foreseeable oh. future. This one's from Minestina. Alec is innocent. The DNA under Maggie's nails and the brown clumps of hair she died gripping onto belong to the actual killer. I'm disgusted that the jurors said guilty just because they wanted to go home <sighs> how do you respond to someone the like brown that? hair was a ferret hair Did uh, you know well that? no so, no no is that so, true so Amy? There, are, there are people who will believe what they want to believe Amen. and i Amen. and and i just i just feel like the evidence of of the hair was was identified it was clear it was it was not anyone's hair the time frame doesn't allow it you have to think about how long and and the person that posed the question, I'm I'm not going to criticize them, but I want them to think about how long it would have taken to get from the top of the driveway to where they were found, or anywhere around the area with the dogs not, um, you know, acting wild or anything. Think about all of the ways in which it doesn't play out that the hair belonged to someone and not the ferret that they said. I mean, it just not, it's not reasonable. Although, you know, people can have their own opinions. It just doesn't sound reasonable. We are going to go. One of the things I said last night was we live in a CSI world now. Yep. And unless they had the, the actual video of the shooting People like this person is not going to believe it. They're going to say innocence. And that's kind of the burden for attorneys today. You mm -hmm. know, we've set the bar so high that it's just impossible unless, you know, it, and even now when we've got it on tape, people get away. It's well, that, that's what I was going to say. Ooh. Even when there's with the body cam videos, even when you when you have a body cam video, even when you have that, we always have to remember for for individuals like that that we have to let the process play out. These are twelve individuals who had to come up with a collective decision who were in the courtroom they actually heard more they heard and saw more than we did on the outside so i think that we have to make the we have to assume that they didn't, one didn't know each other and they made a reasonable decision based on all of the evidence that they saw and things that we don't still don't know. So I'm not, I'm just saying that we cannot say that the jurors are lying, that they made this up or anything, or they weren't paying attention because I believe that they are. And, and if she was a juror, she would want people to believe that she was paying attention. Hey, Sonny, um, and I'm saying, that, um, she, and I'm sorry if I misgendered the individual making the comment. Yeah, Sonny, do you think, I'm curious about this. Do you think, in prison, in the big house, is Alec Murdoch going to be a target or is he going to be protected because of his status? I think he'll be uh, protected because of his status. And um, I don't think that he'll be uh, a target. <laughs> I think he'll be the best jailhouse. He'll be in there writing motherfuckers of pills. Uh huh. That, yeah. Cause that, and that, well said. And, and, and yeah, and he will, he will have not necessarily the luxuries of the inmates. I mean, of the guards, but he will have, because the inmates will need him for a lot of things. So he can do the trade for trade with legal skills and studies and information. They're also going to be fascinated by him because of the name, the um, camaraderie, you know, the notoriety of the case. People are going to want to get information from him. So I don't think he's going to be a target in the way that many people might be a target in a prison. Amy, you know, Lawrence, she's not like my wife on the, the tennis court. Trade. Wait a minute. Uh, somebody high in the drug trade goes to prison. Are they a yeah. target or are they treated well? Yeah. they're Yeah. And he's yeah. probably still going to have access. Oh, man. If he's got enough money, he'll find out who the biggest guy in there is. 
his family will be paying that guy's family, giving him commissary. Yeah. He will be taken care of. He's smart enough. The family has money. He's going to be taken care of. He's yeah. going from Bubba the dog to Bubba the inmate. Um, Blue Jays writes, question, Amy, this is for you because you're the insider here. Any thoughts on who you think will make a victim impact statement? Will we see someone from Maggie's family? Maggie's family's been awfully quiet. You think that all changes tomorrow morning? I think, I think, it, I think um, Dr. Rhodes may be right on this. I don't think we're going to hear from many people, if, if anybody at all. Um, I just think that Matt, I think after watching Marion testify, their dad is in really bad health and his and, their, and her mom. And um, I just don't foresee, I think they just want this to be over, right? Yeah. Yes. And I, a piece of that is, if they speak out, they may lose community grace if they do that. Well, and I mean, even if they speak out against Alex, it would be a good thing for the community. But like it, but it also like well, it tears the relationship that they have with Buster, and that's all he has. And and that's what I was thinking, Buster. I was thinking mm -hmm. more about Buster, or and I know you're a cold hearted please, asshole, Doctor Rose. Let's, who let's has not no feel bad for the mother or the two boys. Oh, my Lord, did you see how that if you watch the Netflix show about how that boy acted when he killed that one woman, that tells you everything about the parenting, the relationship. Assholes raise assholes. Is that what you're trying to say? Because I oh, agree with that. Yeah, I, 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 they wouldn't let me use that kind of language when I grew up. So I don't, I, but I get it. I understand. <laughs> He's a refined, demure man. No truer comment. No, no truer comment than from Stewart here. Morgan Freeman will play <laughs> okay, Judge I, Newman. I can see that, Stewart. I can see that. I can I, see that. I could see that for mm -hmm. sure, sure, sure. Mm -hmm. Tim, to you, and we're gonna wind this up in just a couple of minutes. I keep saying Sorry, it, but uh, I'm delirious at this point. Melissa Joy writes: Jim was way too close to the family. I mean, Tim. Would you ever involve yourself in a murder case where you're friends with the, uh, you know, the person who is uh, on trial? I mean, it just seemed it seemed off to me. Yeah, um, we've had cases where I've had my partners do the case because too close to family or, you know, you just don't feel comfortable. You can't win. It's like representing a, a relative. You, you can't win because you can't get it dropped fast mm -hmm. enough. Or you didn't do a good job because family, you didn't, weren't getting paid and uh, and the family member won't listen to you because they, they look at you as the brother or the, they don't look at you as a, the lawyer giving them advice. Yeah. Um, and I think it was difficult. And representing a lawyer is even more difficult. Uh, politicians and lawyers are difficult to represent because they believe they know more than you do and they believe they can talk their way out of anything. And most times they're more worried about their public image than they are the court case. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's that's also therapy, right there. <laughs> and law, and law enforcement. Yeah, so you know, you something though, we're like all Amy, in the same business, just different areas. So Amy Zimmer, Chuck, and I were talking, and I'm like, so I am a very emo. I don't. You probably picked up on this just a little, but I'm very like an emo, <laughs> a very big feeling kind of girl. You know what I mean? And I tried, I did an innocence project and man had been in prison for 20 years and he was exonerated. I cried through the whole damn trial, y'all. I was like, a sob, like I couldn't imagine. And I'm like that in a lot of my trials, I'm very emotional. I mean, I wouldn't cry through the whole thing, but if it had been Amy Z up there, who I love and adore and give a kidney to me lining up to give it to her, that she was up there. I, I, I don't know. I don't. I don't even know if I could even like get a word out. Do you know what I mean? And Jim, and it was really weird and icky and like, because he's the one who's doing like Marion, right? The, they've all been on vacations together. And then they're like, and then like Ronnie Crosby, he's like, Dick, you know, this Jim, you know, and it's like, oh, ooh, ooh, ooh. just all feel icky and weird mm -hmm. and very incestuous. South Carolina is a very, very small bar anyway. Like we all know all these attorneys involved. So even if we don't like aren't close with them, but like, you know, the Murdoch firm and you may tell you mm -hmm. how you know it because you don't bring a case, a personal injury case in, in Colleton or Hampton County without co-counseling them because you won't get anywhere. <laughs> it's true. You have to, wow. you have to wrestle with wow. them or you don't get anywhere. You know, I had a judge tell me a story um, about how Randolph went, would go um, when he was the solicitor, he would go into 
uh, while the Murdoch were picking their jury and sit in the jury box while they're doing board iron and stuff. Like I'm taking notes, you know, he said it was just, it's just really, really weird. It's crazy. Oh, Terry Small writes Carolina, life. Is, life is a South game of Carolina. Life, <laughs> life is a game of inches. That's and Terry right. writes, we forget that Alec almost got away with this. It was Paul's videos that made all the difference from the grave. This kid, uh, the grave the, this kid gave us what happened to him. Do you agree with that, Dr. Rhodes? I mean, it could have gone a totally different way if we didn't hear Alex's voice on that, uh, yeah, on that I, video. I think that's powerful. And when you look at even the history of some other murder cases, you know, there's this one thing, you know, they find the glasses of somebody or they find a, a piece of a shoe from somebody and it convicts them. Uh, this is what happens when they let people investigate. And uh, Alex thought he was smarter than that crowd. That's what it was about. He he had no respect for authority. Uh, he had grown up with no respect from the authority. And it took something like uh, Paul's video to, to, nail, to put the nail in the coffin for him. People don't know this, and I've been told this by multiple, like, very high people, that they could not get his phone unlocked, and they had to hire a hacker to come into SLED to help hack his phone because they couldn't get it open. Wow. Which I think is really funny. Whose phone? Paul's. Paul's. Because yeah. no one had yeah. his password. There, there's no innocent person in this whole crowd. No. And they <laughs> have a, they've been guilty for years. <laughs> so if you feel sad or any of the listeners feel sad for anybody, um, I don't know who that'd be. I, I think that was sure. complicit. I, yeah, I don't think the law enforcement handled the case uh, oh my in, in properly from from the very beginning, from their arrival on to the scene. When when he said that he had a weapon, the dispatcher should have told him to put actually put the weapon in the car, close the door. So he did not have access to that when they came up. I also don't think that they came up like guns blaring and looking for a suspect. It doesn't seem like they handle, that is not the way that uh, people are trained. Now, I'm one of the few non-sworn persons to do the Drug Task Force Supervisor School for Homeland Security. And uh, I was in a class of 32 men uh, with long guns and everything. And I actually was chosen to be command of our hostage sim uh, uh, simulation uh, for the end of our class. And that is not how we would direct, how I would have directed them to arrive upon a scene and not first cordon off everything, but also go in search. It does not seem like they were looking for, actively looking for a suspect onto the property, which would have taken a very long time because they would have really needed to search, do a grid search of the property, even at night, doing the walk, doing the house, not allowing people to even come up onto the property. So there should have been somebody there to stop all of the folks that um, came on to that to that area up near the house and they should have never been allowed to the house they should have never been allowed to close the scene off so so i'm really i was really concerned about how they did that off all together and um i just think they they really need some uh some different kind of uh assessment on how they did that because that showed a lot of favoritism well let me just tell you this sled has been screwing up cases for many many years um, that case that we were talking about, that Innocence Project we did 20 years ago, the lady's throat is slit. There's a box cutter beside of her head. No one took it into evidence. Oh my God. That's There's bloody scissors in the bathroom and no one took it into the into evidence. I mean, they do not, don't, don't, don't tell the law enforcement instructor that. And don't they know. are supposed to be the best of our best right here in the state of South Carolina. There are state Bureau of Investigation and they're still messing it up. And if they don't, if something doesn't change, we're going, I mean, they're lucky that Alex Murdoch, I mean, this could have just as easily been a hunger and not guilty. I'm not going to lie. I really think it could have been. 
I mean, I think we were all. There, you know what? There's a lot of corruption, I think, anywhere you go, not just, and it's, you know, it's prevalent. Not corruption. It's not corruption. It's lack of training and accountability. It's incompetence. It's, 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 it's lack of it's training, incompetence, incompetence yeah. and lack of accountability. And that's the it's problem. A, and yeah, they messed up this case from start to finish, and there will be no accountability for it, right? Mm -hmm. Because they won. And that's, I mean, they need to go back and they need to really dig deep and look, look and get some more training and figure this out because everybody deserved better than what SLED gave them. Maggie deserved better, Paul deserved better, and Alex deserved better. Everybody And the community better. deserves and the community. it. The community. Yes. And A.G. Wilson made it a point, and so did Creighton Waters, to thank SLED because it's a political move and, and they've got to thank well, him he's for running for work. governor. That was his announcement tonight. You didn't hear it? I heard it. <laughs> Andy School writes, Tim, do you think Jim is regretting representing his friend? I wonder if he didn't choke up literally during closing arguments because he felt, he, because he felt too much pressure. Thoughts to the panel, meaning Tim, on this one. Um, I'm sure, you know, Jack earlier said he thought that um, Griff thought that he was innocent. Um, and I'm sure it's really difficult representing a friend. But I'm sure when that video came up at the end. I think that Griff, pretty smart <laughs> guy, had to know that his client and their defense is going to take a 360. And they are really, he has to re-question um, his guilt or innocence of his client. But at that point, it's too late. Um, I know that I think that Alec was probably second guessing having Griff do the closing after he heard him do the closing. Mm -hmm. um, I thought Alex I, was going to end up doing the closing. I I think that you could look at Alex look face during the closing by Griff. He wasn't happy at all. Um, clearly, mm -hmm. he didn't get what he thought he was paying for. Mm -hmm. um, and it's hard representing someone like that. But, you know, he, he knew him. He came to him. He believed him. Probably getting paid very well. Um, you look at the experts they hired. Oh, so, okay, I can defend this case. Dick and I are going to do it. We're going to have unlimited resources. All the Those experts. Are the worst freaking, and I'm trying not to curse, freaking <laughs> experts I've ever seen. Or too, too late. They were yeah. the worst. They, it was like paying $3,000 for ugly Gucci, right? But they didn't, there was no, yeah. like, Dr. George Kirkham mm -hmm. would have been the best criminologist Ever. He's charismatic. He explains things where people understand his inflection is his voice. He's excited about what he does. I mean, these like they picked the worst. They picked the, and they were all the best. Probably yeah. the best was Kinsey and he got paid the least. But Suzanne but Smith. He was good. <laughs> Suzanne yeah. Smith writes, did Alec, uh, and this is to you, Dr. Rhodes, and I have no idea if you know the answer because I sure don't. Did Alec even look at Buster? after the guilty verdict. Mm -hmm. But beyond that question, what do you think? You study dysfunction in families. What do you think the relationship between Buster and Alec is like behind closed doors? They're not going to have one uh, unless it's behind closed prison doors on Alec's side now. But what do you, what do you think is going on here? I believe that Buster is in fear of Alex. He's been raised to be in fear of Alex. I don't care where you put Alex. He's like a spider. His web's going to go everywhere. And Buster doesn't want to be caught up in that web. So he's mm -hmm. going to do his best to do his best. And if you don't think Alex looks at the film after each day and looks at how, what B Buster looked like and then would hold him to it, then you missed the boat. I'm so, looking. you know, I, I just see Buster distancing himself and moving on. He was, I think he was already doing that before all this happened. And I'd be real surprised if Buster was surprised it ended like it did. I think, I think it was a, a Mack truck don't going downhill. It was cruising. Well, Joel, it's not done yet though. Right. Cause there's still the Smith case. Yeah. Oh, we're gonna. Yeah, I, you know, I I think all these cases are gonna have to be resolved. Mallory Beach is still happening. You know, all these things are gonna have to. And now I think they're uh, Amy reopening um, the Gloria Satterfield case. Is that gonna happen? Um, a lot of dead bodies piling up around this family. So I think yes. there's many, many well, unanswered questions. Well, what do we say? It's like my grandpa always said, "Where there's a murder, there's a Murdoch." 
Yeah. <laughs> well said. Well said. I can't do the southern accent, but someone said if you say Alec Murdoch very quickly in a heavy southern accent, it sounds like I like murder, but I can't do it. So, <laughs> I, I can't do it. But Natalie writes, I love the economy of words. This is probably the very best way to sum this all up. It has been yeah. a very long night. Thank Natalie you. writes, karma is real. Dr. Rhodes, I'll tell you this. Dr. Phil and Dr. Drew have nothing on you. If Oprah <laughs> discovered you first, you'd be sitting in the mansion that Dr. Phil is in right now. But what are your final thoughts on this uh, on this evening, which is uh, – an interesting one to say the least, a little melancholic on my part. I don't know. I don't find um, this to be a victory one way or the other. I just think yeah. it's sort of sad all around with justice served, but everyone's life kind of ruined uh, by this, by these actions. Here's, here's something I'm going to go a little bit off course here. Please do. Dr. Phil came from Tulsa, Oklahoma. I come from Oklahoma city, Oklahoma. Oh. If at some point I use the same words, but not cussing, uh, <laughs> it's for real. And do I believe there is a winner in this? Only the people selling the story are the winners. Yeah. That nobody in that area is a winner. That family's not a winner. But that family will always have money. Yeah. So things go down a little easier when you got some money behind it. Sunny Slaughter, uh, she works and trains law enforcement and is an all around great person. Sunny, what are we plugging for you here? I want to plug. Uh, you have a <laughs> website, a show. What can I plug for you? Uh, yeah, check out my uh, YouTube channel. My uh, but my website, SunnySlaughter.com. Joel, I want to thank you for having me back on. You were the uh, very first person that I jumped on all of this with, and I'm so grateful to you. You know, you're my Jersey man. I'm a yeah. Jersey girl, <laughs> but um, we, you know, we've kind of tried to get some relief out of this conversation tonight. But this has impacted all of us. This is the first uh, I've been spending a lot of time on the on the on this case on uh, Law and Crime Network uh, regularly. It is painful though uh, mm -hmm. for me when I, I'm I'm a law enforcement instructor. I do litigation work, but I'm also a victim's advocate, and this is painful because um, two people were murdered, maybe more. It took six weeks. It has taken a lot for all of us. I know, Joel, for you to cover it constantly, for us to try to inform the public. Uh, this leaves scars for so many people in so many ways. And I think with all of the work, thank you all. Um, it's great to meet all of you. Thank you all for the amazing work that you do to make a difference in the world every day. Uh, Sometimes I don't think the public realizes how we're, we're talking and we're kind of laughing right now, but this is a uh, painful work to do constantly, Joel, for you to cover it constantly. So I just want to say for all of us, give yourselves some grace uh, in this moment. Uh, Paul and Maggie are resting. Uh, I don't know how much peace the family has. But a verdict is the verdict. He is guilty. Uh, and there's still more after this. So I look forward to being with you all again at some point in time. But really take care of yourselves. And, and for the audience, your listening audience, you know I love the STS Nation and I love interacting with them. They, they're shouting me out and everything. But everyone, uh, this is a murder trial. I, it seems like it's the end, but it's really the beginning in some ways. So let's remember that point. And I just thank you all. And thanks again, Joel. Thanks, Sonny. And right on cue, uh, Shivani, a friend of the show, writes, by the way, Dr. Rhodes, before I get to the comment, what can I plug for you? You are a uh, highfalutin therapist <laughs> in South Carolina. Anything to promote for you? Yeah, promote that I'm not a murder. <laughs> you see that? that I'm, I'm, I'm thinking I'm in good shape. Uh, I and, love that. Uh, I love Dr. Rhodes. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, I'm just happy to be here, be around excellent people that are busting it for the people. 
Yeah. This is where it really is. Busting it for the people. I'm going to get a bumper sticker that says that. I love it. I love it. Yeah. Um, yeah. Shivani writes, amazing grace, relief. I feel thankful. This comment uh, has a special place in my heart. My mother, my dear mother, hosting the show with me this Sunday night, is a Holocaust survivor. She has one of the funniest senses of humor. Uh, she lost a child. She's been through hell and back. My father's not doing great. So there's a lot going on. She always mm -hmm. laughs, and she says you need a uh, little black humor, dark humor to get through things. And this comment right here, let's lighten up, people. The jury did their duty and came up with a right verdict. Nothing wrong with lightheartedness after such a strenuous trial. Amy yeah. Lawrence, lovely, do you feel a little sense of relief tonight and sort of like a burden has been lifted off the shoulders of South Carolina. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, absolutely. Um, I think that somewhere in the Alex show, right. We joked around um, that if he was really the narcissistic piece of shit that he was, then he was going to put it on with jazz hands and all. And we got the show. Right. But somehow we lost sight of while we were there and it was there for the brutal murder of Maggie and Paul. And tonight, um, they got some sort of justice, whatever that looks like. And so there's like a, like we can all take a, a big kind of like deep breath now on some level because it's kind of consumed our life because six weeks is a long time for a trial, especially in South Carolina. I mean, we wrap these boys up very quickly. Um, I mean, when we picked a jury in a day, I was like blown away. Um, but I think that we can all just kind of take a deep breath. But I think that Sonny is right, that this is just the beginning. And that we're going to, I mean, I know a lot of stuff because I've seen a lot of discovery with Amy Z, um, that all this stuff will start coming out. And I think those that are the naysayers will probably feel more comfortable and, and better about the justice that was gotten tonight. And, um, and also as a lawyer who does personal injury work as well as criminal defense, like nothing makes me more mad than bad lawyers, right? Like we don't get to have bad apples, just like you don't get to have bad apples for pilots or bad apples for cops, right? We don't get, we don't get that luxury. And so when I see people who do horrible things, like take the money out of a quadriplegic's mouth, right? That just like, I could just go choke his ass out just thinking about it. Or, you know. <laughs> well said. Making, making some child who's been in a car where his, her, their mother has died and they've almost died and their brothers died and they're over there begging for school supplies. Like that's the kind of stuff that just sends me over the edge and I want to be a vigilante. So, and it wasn't maybe just justice for Paul and Maggie, but it was just for all those people and that there will be accountability and that bad apple is gone and we will root him out when we find out that there is one. By the way, Amy Lawrence Lovely works with her husband and they are still married and uh, <laughs> I think they're having fun tonight if you were following this whole I mean, show. Everybody's and wondering if there's a God, there it is, there's a God. Yeah, she uh, she is the owner with her husband of the lovely law firm. If you're in trouble in South Carolina, you reach out. By the way, I love this comments. I love new members, new STS Nation members. Mardella Roland became a YouTube member, and I can promise you, Mardella, no one curses as much as Amy, except maybe my mother, but she doesn't do it on air. She only <laughs> it to check, her. Check us out on our YouTube channel if you want to hear more of my commentary on South Carolina law stuff or um, just stuff around. It's the lovely law firm on our YouTube. Tim Jansen, you are the uh, veteran, seasoned criminal defense attorney out of Tallahassee, the great state of Florida. You blew a lot of people away when you were just off the top of your head. Uh, prior to uh, the cross of Alec Murdoch, you were rattling off questions that should have been asked, and uh, people were super impressed with what you had to say then. Very convincing attorney. Your final thoughts, man, as I take uh, some of my last breaths for the evening. <laughs> Not life. Very proud of this jury. Very proud of the judicial system. I think a lot of people learned what happens in trials. The judge was wonderful. The witnesses were fair. I think people understand now that what lawyers do. Um, you can't say that this defendant didn't get a fair trial. He had excellent lawyers and the case was decided um, much quicker than I thought. I thought there would be a backlash. I thought because it was circumstantial evidence and that they really didn't have a motive. I thought that there would be some, some cajoling in the jury room. And I thought like two or three people might not be able to get a verdict. I predicted maybe an Allen charge 
That's mm-hmm. why I was predicting a lengthy uh, deliberation. But I got to say, I'm proud. I uh, The jury saw through everything. I think they got the right verdict. I liked how the judge said, I'm not telling you what how your verdict was, but you did a great job um, <laughs> commending them that the verdict was sufficient with the evidence. And I'm kind of glad to see Florida's not in in national news again for the crazy wacko murder crimes we have in Florida. Don't worry, it's coming soon. We're doing yeah. the Dan Markell case, and trust me, there's plenty of crazy, plenty and of I'm, crazy. It's, it's been a pleasure to meet the the South Carolina lawyers up there. Uh, one day, I hope to get up there and see meet some of the people in person. Uh, some really good lawyers. Oh, now we met great lawyers, and when we pivot to Dan Markell, we're going to pivot to Lori Vallow out in Idaho. Uh, we're going to bring all these lawyers back on, as well as Sonny and Dr. Rhodes to comment on all that. A final comment here from Very British. I guess it goes without saying that he's not American, and I pulled this up for a reason. He writes, I'm still stumped. It was three hours deliberation. That snacks, not an American word there, so I know he's definitely British. That snacks, a pre- not even a South Carolina word there. And I don't understand half of South Carolina, but that's a whole other story. That snacks of prejudice, not overwhelming evidence, followed by Lauren Giselle. I still don't think he did it, but you know what? This is the American justice system. A jury of 12 peers came up with uh, this verdict today, and that is what we live with, and uh, that is what makes America America and the land of the free and the home of the brave. A quick programming note. We are live tomorrow, 1230 p.m. Eastern time with Detective Phil Waters. He's investigated 400 homicides. Wow. He's coming on with former FBI agent Scott Duffy, along with an investigative reporter for the Idaho statesman, Kevin Fixler. And uh, Kevin has spoken to a lot of family and friends of Brian Kohlberger, the accused killer uh, mm-hmm. in Moscow, Idaho. And he's going to come on and tell us all about that. And if that's not enough, 5.30 tomorrow night uh, live, we're doing another panel about this case, all the fallout from the Alec Murdoch verdict. Sunday evening, I get no rest. I'm with my mom at 7 p.m. Eastern. We are speaking to the parents of Ellen Greenberg, who was stabbed 20 times, 10 mm-hmm. times in the back, twice after her heart stopped beating. <laughs> it was ruled a suicide. <coughs> Insanity. So oh, wow. we are speaking to the parents. That is an ongoing case. We're trying to bring attention to it's it. Like- oh, she froze up on the final <laughs> question. <laughs> that is what we call a tease, my friend. What was that, Amy? We, we didn't hear the I question. Said, did Sled work that case? <laughs> did Sled work that case? There's the humor we need. As far as I know, <laughs> it was all Philly all the time. But uh, I'd like to get, oh, justice. We need to get justice for the Greenbergs. Until then, thanks to our panel. Thanks to SDS Nation. Thanks to our best guests. Love you, America. Love you, South Carolina. Love you, Jersey. Love you, Tallahassee. Look, 